Okay, let's start the session now. Uh, hello guys, good morning and welcome you all in this AI 900 session. Myself, Archie Dissel, I'm your host for this session. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We will be there to help you out. Then moving ahead and talking about our event sponsor, that is Synergetics. So Synergetics is an India one-of-kind one co-porting learning solution company. Now you will get question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, we boost our offering and also give complimentary advisory service to client who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advise, implement, and manage. Then the Synergetics solution offering that is persona-based onboarding solution. Onboarding add-on solution, certification solution, certification add-on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre-sales training solution, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. Then what does Microsoft certification does? It will give you complete learning experience, build confidence to appear for the exam and get certified. This is skilling journey. Here you can advance yourself. First, you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role based certification and expert level certification. In fundamental certification, we are providing you AJ 900, AI 900, DP 900, PL 900, and SC 900. In associate level certification, we are providing you many types of certification. Here you, here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, we are providing you AZ305, SC100, PL600, and AZ400. Also, we have special certification that is AZ120, AZ140, and AZ220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more. Moving ahead and today training is organized and handled by the ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. Under ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Azure Tech community for Pune Kars. Emerging technology community for Surat Kars. Azure Tech community for Nagpur Kars. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow code of conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Today's speaker for this training is Mish Shah. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as a trainer consultant. Agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and benefit of it. In this session, we are providing you AI 900 Learning Achievement Badge. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Make sure guys you follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for upcoming uh, information. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic our speaker. He will continue already. Thank you, Archie. So good morning to everyone. Welcome to today's session on AI 900. AI 900, as you would know, is a certification course by Azure that covers various AI services. So, G so the ag agenda for today's session will be to cover the basics of AI. So you will get to learn what is AI. Then you will get to learn what are the different AI services that Azure Cloud Platform offers. And out of the various AI services that Azure Cloud Platform offers, We'll try to cover three services today. First will be our speech service. The second will be our vision service. And third will be the document intelligence service. So these will be the three main services that we'll try to cover. So as I mentioned, first we'll try to cover basics of AI. So we'll get to learn what is AI. 
then we'll cover the various AI services that Azure offers. And out of the various AI services, we'll focus on three services. First is speech service, second is vision service, third is document intelligence service. So before going ahead, let me give a brief introduction out myself. My name is Smith Shah and I will be your mentor for today. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. On top of that, I'm a Azure certified data scientist, a Azure certified AI engineer, a Azure certified data engineer as well. So yeah, that's just a brief introduction about me. Now let's proceed ahead with our today's training. So first, let's start with the basics of AI. So if anybody asks you to define AI, what will you say? If anybody asks you, what is AI? What will you say? Well, guys, AI is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First purpose is to obtain inferences from data. By inference, I mean insights. The second purpose is to obtain predictions from data. So let's say I want to know something that is going to happen in the future. Let's say based on how it has rained till the year 2023, I want to predict how it will rain in the year 2024. That's an example of prediction. So AI is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First is to obtain inferences from data. Second is to obtain predictions from data. Now you might ask me, Smith, how do we do that? How do we get inferences and predictions from data? Well, we do that by using something called a AI model. Now there's a fancy term that is used in the market nowadays, AI model. What does it mean? Let's try to understand. So first I will show you a definition of AI model that might look complex at first, but do not worry, we'll try to simplify it. So let's understand what is a AI model. So guys, AI model is nothing but a statistical representation of a real world process. Let's understand this complex definition in a simple manner. In order to understand it, let, let us take help of some data. So let's suppose in that data, I have information about some of the houses in my locality. Let's suppose I have information about the area of the house in square feet. And I also have information about the price of that house. So let's suppose the first house that I surveyed had an area of 100 square feet and the price of that house was 1 crore. The second house that I surveyed had an area of 200 square feet and the price of that house was 2 crore. Similarly, the third house that I surveyed had an area of 300 square feet and the price of that house was 3 crore. Now, I have a question to each and every one of you. Let's suppose I have information of a fourth house. The area of that fourth house is 350 square feet. But I don't know the price of that house. I want you guys to help me predict the price of the house. What will you say? So according to you guys, what do you feel could be the price of this fourth house over here? So Shubham mentions in the chat that according to him, he is predicting the price of this house to be 3.5 crore, right? Even Prince has mentioned the same in the chat. According to him, he feels the price of this house will be 3.5 crore. So fine, you have given me a prediction. Now Shubham and Prince, in order to arrive at this prediction, did you use some mathematics in your head? Yes or no? In order to arrive at this prediction, did you use some mathematics in your head? Shubham says yes, absolutely. So just like Shubham, you used mathematics in your head to simulate what would happen in the real world. You wanted to find out what would have been the real price of the house, right? So you wanted to simulate a real world process. And Shubham, in order to do that, you tried to use some mathematics. That's exactly what an AI model does. A AI model also tries to use mathematics or tries to use statistics to simulate what would happen in the real world. So just like you guys, try to simulate a real world process by using statistics or by using mathematics, a AI model will also try to do that. Now, Shubham has mentioned a doubt in the chat. Shubham says this training session will be useful for data analysts or data scientists. So this will be particularly useful for data scientists. Okay. So if anybody wants to go into the field of data science, this session will be useful for them. For data analysts, no. 
Okay, this session will be particularly useful for data scientists. Okay, anyways. So moving on from that doubt. So up till now, guys, what what all things have we covered? First, we covered the definition of AI. We said AI is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First is to obtain inferences from data. Second is to obtain predictions from data. You might ask me, Smith, how do we do that? How do we gain inferences and predictions from data? We do that by using something called an AI model. What is the AI model? It's a statistical representation of a real world process. In simple words, we are trying to simulate a real world process by using statistics or by using mathematics. Now, let's move forward. Now, guys, before making an AI model, there are two important notes that you need to keep in mind. First important note is that for any AI model to work, or in other words, in order to make any AI model, we need some data, and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. You might ask me, Smith, I have heard that we can make an AI model on image data as well. Image data is not in the form of rows and columns. Well, whatever type of data you work on, at the end of the day, it has to be converted into row and column format. Then only you can make an AI model on it. So remember, whenever you are going to make an AI model, you will need to have some data with you, and that data will need to have some rows and some columns. Okay, this is note number one. Note number two is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Feature columns are those columns that help me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. Let's understand the difference between a feature column and a target column with the help of an example. So in that example, let's suppose I have some data to show you. Here you can see the data in front of your screen. Now, my first question to you is, on this data, can I make an AI model? Yes or no? What do you think? I repeat my question. My first question to you is, on this data, can I make an AI model? What do you think, guys? Yes, right? Prinj, Shubham, and other students are saying that, yes, we can make an AI model. Well, to give you a hint how to answer uh, that particular question, you should have referred this note number one. As per note number one, if we are going to make an AI model, we need to have some data with us, and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. And you can see this data does have some rows and some columns. So on this data, we can definitely build an AI model. Okay. So through note number one, we got to know that on this data, we can definitely build an AI model. All right. Now, let's focus on note number two. As per note number two, I have mentioned, that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Feature columns are those columns that help me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. So if I want to predict price, then price will be which type of column, guys? I repeat, what is the difference between a feature and a target column? Feature column is that column that helps me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. So if I want to predict price, then price will be which type of column? As Prince, Umesh, and other students are saying in the chat, that since I want to predict on price, then price will be my target column. Then does square feet and city help me to predict price? Yes, they do. So square feet and city will be called my feature columns. If there is any other column that is neither a feature column nor a target column, you should remove that column. That column will be useless for you, and you have to remove it. Okay, so remember these two notes before creating any AI model. Note number one is that for making any AI model to work, you will need some data and that data will need to have some rows and some columns. Note number two is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Feature columns are those columns that help me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. Fine. Now. Let's understand the different ways in which we, I, we can make an AI model. So there are two different ways, or I, sh I should say there are two different approaches. First is by using the approach of machine learning. Second is by using the approach of deep learning. We won't dive into the details of both these approaches. I will try to give a simplistic overview of both these approaches so that you can understand the difference. 
okay in order to dive into the depth of both these approaches we'll have to take a uh, lot of hours of training so for this session i won't dive into the details of both these approaches let me give a simplistic difference of both these approaches to you so as i mentioned there are two main ways or there are two main approaches to make a ai model first is by using the approach of machine learning second is by using the approach of deep learning let's understand the difference so guys machine learning is like using a knife machine learning is like using a knife whereas deep learning is like using a machete okay whereas deep learning is like using a machete now let me ask this one simple question to you okay it's not related to ai i'm just asking a general question that let's say you want to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or a apple in that scenario which tool will you use will you use a knife or will you use a machete well technically you can use both right you can use a knife as well as machete to cut those simple objects that i mentioned just like that on any type of data you can use any approach yeah i can use the machine learning approach also i can use the deep learning approach also but which is better let's try to understand so i asked the question to you that if i want to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or a apple in that scenario which tool will i use will i use a knife or will i use a machete so prince and shubham are saying that yes technically i can use both knife and machete but in order to cut simple objects like a tomato or a apple knife will be better just like that guys just like that in order to work on simple data sets where the relationship between feature and target is not that complex on that type of data set it's better to use machine learning okay on the other hand guys let's say uh, let me ask another general question to you let's suppose you are cutting a complex object like a coconut in order to cut cut a coconut guys what tool will you use will you use a knife or will you use a machete well technically you can use both knife and machete as well just like that on any type of data you can use any approach of making ai model machine learning and deep learning but coming back to my question if i want to cut a complex object like a coconut which tool will be ideal knife or machete so shubham says machete will be ideal just like that shubham if i have a complex data set a data set wherein the relationship between feature and target is complex to understand on such type of data set it is better to use deep learning okay fine uh okay shubham let me ask another question to you so you have correctly mentioned that in order to cut simple objects like a potato tomato or apple knife will be ideal although you can use machete as well but knife will be ideal shubham uh, why did you say that why according to you in order to cut simple objects like a tomato or apple knife is ideal why you mentioned the correct answer absolutely but what was the reason why to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato you chose knife as a tool what was the reason can anyone mention the reason you guys gave the correct answer that in order to cut simple objects like a knife uh, like a potato or a tomato knife will be ideal but what is the reason anyone with the reason it can be wrong not a issue just mention it in the chat shubham pradeep prince according to you what was the reason why did you choose a knife can i say one major reason is that knife is simple to use okay knife is simple to use whereas using a tool like machete is complex only trained people should use it okay just like that guys just like that making a ai model through machine learning approach is much more simpler okay simpler to make simpler to make okay whereas on the same data if i use the approach of deep learning it will be comparatively complex to make fine let us understand more reasons so when i asked you that if i want to cut a simple object like a tomato or a potato or apple 
which tool I should use, knife or machete. You correctly answered knife. What was another reason to choose knife? First is obviously simple to use. Okay, simpler to handle. Second is what? Second, can I say a factor could be cost? So in the market, if I try to buy one of these tools, either a knife or a machete, knife will be less costly. Machete will be more costly. Similarly, guys, on a data, if I try to make a AI model through machine learning, the cost is comparatively low. Okay, the computation cost. So let's say I am going to do these computations on a cloud platform, on some servers of some cloud platform. Now, the more computations I do on those servers, the more amount of money I have to pay. Okay, so on a data, if I try to make a AI model through machine learning, it involves less mathematical computations because of which the cost is low. On the other hand, on the same exact data, if I try to make a AI model through deep learning, the cost will be high. Why? Because more uh, it does deep learning does more mathematical computations. Okay, fine. So remember these few differences between machine learning and deep learning. On simpler data sets, you use machine learning. So on data sets wherein the relationship between feature and target is easy to understand, you use machine learning. Whereas on data sets where the relationship between feature and target is complex to understand, there you will try to use deep learning. Technically, guys, I can use both machine learning approach as well as deep learning approach. I can use any of the approaches on any type of data. But which is ideal on simple data sets, machine learning approach is ideal on complex data sets, deep learning approach is ideal. Also remember that machine learning uh, using the machine learning approach is simpler. OK, so let's say if you are starting as a fresher, you have just um, learned programming languages right now. OK, you will see that creating a AI model through machine learning is much simpler for you, whereas creating a AI model through deep learning will be slightly more complex. Third point, remember that since machine learning approach involves less mathematical computations, the computation cost will be low. Whereas on the same data, deep learning approach will do more mathematical computations. So cost will be high. But uh, so you might uh, tell me that, OK, if machine learning is simpler to handle, cost is low, why would I prefer deep learning? Remember that if you use the as compared to machine learning just one second guys i lost my internet connection i feel i lost my internet connection um let me check over here if i'm connected to the correct wi-fi let me connect to 5g wi-fi let me check whether it is occurring over here okay let me connect over this okay fine so i hope now i won't have any network issues all right, uh, so a general question over here, Shubham, to you and everybody else. So Shubham, fine, uh, you have given me the difference between uh, which tool to use for which scenario. For simple objects like potato or a tomato, use knife. For complex objects like a coconut, use machete. But Shubham and other students, can I say that a machete will always cut better as compared to knife? Can I say that? The performance in cutting of machete will always be better as compared to knife. Similarly, guys, a deep learning approach will always give you better accuracy for predictions. Okay. As compared to machine learning approach. Okay, so deep learning approach will always give you better accuracy for predictions as compared to machine learning. However, why is the machine learning still used if machine learning does not give that much better performance as compared to deep learning? Why is machine learning used? Well, cost is less. Okay. Then secondly, it is much more simpler to make. So these are the two reasons why machine learning is still used. But remember that deep learning approach will always give you better accuracy. Okay. So this is a simplistic overview of both these approaches of creating an AI model. I'm not uh, diving much into the depth as it will take us a lot of time to cover the depth and uh, we'll miss our agenda for today. Fine. So moving on. So up till now, what have we covered? Let's do a quick revision. So guys, first I showed you the definition of AI. So I mentioned that AI is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. 
first is to gain inferences from data second is to gain predictions from data you might ask me smith how do we do that how do we gain inferences and predictions from data we do that by using something called a ai model what is a ai model it's a statistical representation of a real world process in simple words we are trying to simulate a real world process using some statistics or using some mathematics then let's go ahead and let's learn the two important notes for creating a ai model we had learned those two important notes few minutes back first important note is that for making any ai model you need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns the second important note that you need to remember is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict target column is that column that i want to predict so in this data if i want to predict price then price will be my target column does square feet help me to predict price yes so it will be called my feature column does city help me to predict price yes so it will be called my feature column so square feet and city over here will be called my feature column after that we learn the two important approaches to make any ai model first is using the approach of machine learning second is using the approach of deep learning so we learn the differences between these two approaches now let's go ahead and let's learn the different types of ai models let's understand the different types of ai models remember guys that there are many many types of ai models and after 8 to 10 months a new type of ai model comes into the market however 95% of the work done in the ai industry nowadays is done on these two types only first type is called supervised learning model second type is called unsupervised learning model let's learn the difference between the two so what is the difference between a supervised learning model and a unsupervised learning model in case of a supervised learning model the data that we are using has features and target both in case of a unsupervised learning model the data that i am using only has features it does not have target so remember guys that there are many many types of ai models after 8 to 10 months a new type of ai model comes into the market but majority of the work in fact 95% of the work done in the ai industry is done on these two types only the ones mentioned on your screen so for today's session we'll only cover these two types first type of ai model is called supervised learning model second type of ai model is called unsupervised learning model in case of a supervised learning model the data that we are using has features and target both in case of a unsupervised learning model the data that we are using only has features it does not have target then supervised learning models are further divided into two types first is classification model second is regression model what is the difference between the two well in case of a classification model my target column has finite set of possibilities whereas in case of a regression model my target column has infinite set of possibilities let's understand the difference between a classification model and a regression model with the help of a example so let's suppose i have a column with me called dice roll and what i am doing is let's suppose i am playing a game of dice with my friends and whenever i roll the dice whatever value i get that value i am storing it in this column so let's say when i first roll the dice i get the value 4 then again when i roll the dice i get the value 6 after that when i roll the dice i get the value 1 then when i roll the dice i get the value 6 and so on now i have a question to each and every one of you when i roll a dice how many different possibilities i have when i roll the dice how many different possible values can i get can anyone mention it shubham mentions that we have six possibilities either we can get the value 1 on the dice or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 apart from these six possibilities we don't have anything else so shubham is saying that in the dice roll column we have six possibilities or in other words in dice roll column i have finite set of possibilities and if dice roll column was my target column if it was my target column and if in my target column i have finite set of possibilities then my model will be called a classification model let's take one more example suppose i have a column with me called gender and what i am doing is i am storing the gender value of every employee in my office the first employee in my office has a gender of male after that the second employee had a gender of female the third employee had a gender of female and so on so let's suppose i have this gender column 
now i have a question to each and every one of you in the gender column how many different possible value i mean how many different possibilities i have as far as gender is concerned shubham says two possibilities male or female so shubham is saying in the gender column i have finite set of possibilities if gender column was my target column and if in my target column i have finite set of possibilities then my model will be called a classification model let me take one last example suppose i have a column with me called stock price and what i am doing is i'm storing the price of a stock after every day let's say on the first day the price of the stock was 100.293 rupees then on the next day it was 99.1 rupees after that it was 99.31 rupees and so on so as far as stock price is concerned if stock price column was my target column then in this target column do we have finite set of possibilities or do we have infinite set of possibilities well in this target column called stock price we have infinite set of possibilities right as shubham mentions so if in my target column i have infinite set of possibilities that means my model that i am making will be called a regression model so with this we have completed basics of ai now over here rajiv has a doubt rajiv mentioned that okay we know what is ai we know that ai is a set of tools that is used for two purposes first is to get inferences from data second is to gain predictions from data how do we do that we do that by using something called a ai model what is a ai model a ai model is a statistical representation of a real world process but uh, in simple words we can say that ai model tries to simulate a real world process by using statistics or by using mathematics now what rajiv is asking is fine you showed me the two main ways or two approaches to create this ai model first is the approach of machine learning second is the approach of deep learning we understood the basic difference but what rajiv is asking is can you ask, uh, uh, tell me a use case in which i can understand uh, that on that use case will i use machine learning approach or deep learning approach so rajiv in the first difference of these two approaches i had mentioned that on simple data sets wherein the relationship between feature and target is easier to understand you choose machine learning whereas on complex data sets wherein the relationship between feature and target is difficult to understand on that scenario you will use deep learning now this definition on simple and complex is completely up to you so for example let's say i am working with image data okay let's say as a feature i have pixel values of a image okay i have pixel values of a image so let's say in the first row i have pixel values of image 1 in the second row i have pixel values of image 2 and so on okay so let's suppose i have this feature column like this in my target column i have information about uh the let's say the sentiment in that image so in that image uh whether uh there is a happy face or a sad face or a face with mixed emotions okay so let's say i want to do that sentiment analysis on that image that okay in the first image the face that was shown was happy in the second image the face that was shown was sad and so on now over here you tell me rajiv the relationship between feature and target currently is it complex or simple for you if anybody shows you the pixels of image okay pixel values of image and through that if anybody asks you to find out that okay looking at the pixel values tell me if the face shown in the image is happy or sad do you think it's complex for you or simple for you looking at pixel values of image what do you think rajiv looking at pixel values of image not simple right not simple looking at pixel values a pixel values of a image will be between 0 to 255 right so just looking at those pixel values let's say if you show see a pixel value of 10 then in the next pixel the pixel value is of 55 and so on like that you will have pixel values a image consists of pixels okay and in each pixel we have a value between 0 to 255 some pixel could have a value like 50 another pixel could have a value like 41 and so on looking at these pixel values and then finding out whether um uh, the target would be equal to happy or whether the target will be equal to sad 
is complex so currently the uh, the relationship between feature and target is complex and on complex data set we always use deep learning and that's why you will see that whenever basically we are going to work with image data you will see it online as well mostly they are using deep learning approach okay so rajiv just remember this uh, one thing that on simple data sets wherein the relationship between feature and target is simpler to understand you use machine learning on complex data sets wherein the relationship between feature and target is complex to understand you will use deep learning just like over here in our use case okay we felt that relationship between feature and target was complex to understand so i use deep learning approach only now you will get to know that with experience how to classify a data set as a simple data set or a complex data set but this is the main distinction between the two okay fine got it rajiv and shubham okay fine now let's move forward so guys we have completed basics of ai now let's focus on the main agenda for today's session which is the ai 900 certification exam so guys what azure has done uh, is that they have created many many ready made ai models and those ready made ai models they have distributed across different different services or different different categories i can say to be specific azure has divided those ready made ai models into nine categories or nine services let's talk about each services one by one we'll have a overview of each of these services okay and after having a overview we'll also see a demo of some of these services fine so let's dive into the let's focus on the overview of each of these services so let's start with our first category of service called document intelligence service so here you have ready made ai models that you can use to get information from a document okay get information from a document let me show you a use case in which this could be helpful so for example currently what i do guys is uh, at the end of the month i get a invoice from the company that i'm working with okay at the end of the month i get a invoice from the company that i'm working with in that invoice all the details are mentioned like what is the compensation that uh, will be given to me for that month if at all G- i have a gst number uh, with me then the that gst number will be mentioned that okay um this amount should be transferred to that gst id and so on and like that all the uh, details are mentioned okay so every month i get a invoice from the company that i am working with now i have a habit guys that i go through that invoice okay and in that invoice everything is mentioned compensation amount everything i take that compensation amount that is mentioned in the invoice and i put that compensation amount in a excel sheet and through that excel sheet i keep a track that okay in july month the invoice that i had uh, had how much uh, compensation in it then in uh, august month the invoice that i received uh, had how much compensation mentioned in it and so on so currently this information extraction process from a invoice document that i am doing is being done manually this information extraction process from a invoice document is being done manually by me what if i want to do it automatically i don't want to search where that particular information is stored on the invoice i will just tell my ai model that from the invoice give me the gst number that is mentioned and it will give me that i will tell my ai model from that invoice give me the uh, let's say what you can call your compensation amount mentioned and that ai model will give me that compensation amount so this information extraction process from a document whether it is a invoice document or a pan card document or a aadhar card document if that information extraction process i want to do it automatically then in that case i can take help of this ai service called document intelligence service after that let's move on to the second category of ai service offered by azure called language service okay so through this service what can you do you can do many things one thing that you can do is you can automatically create chatbots so let's say you have a website with you and you want to integrate a chatbot into that website let's suppose you have a website similar to lg.com okay let's suppose you have a website over here similar to lg.com let me go to lg.com and show you that in that website how they have integrated that chatbot so here you can see i have opened lg.com 
and on the bottom right hand side they have integrated a chatbot and uh, you know i can go ahead and ask questions to this chatbot and to give me some answer for example i will say um i want to buy tv let's say okay i will ask what type of tvs do you sell and if it if the chatbot is smart it will try to understand this and give me some answer okay fine so over here i am interacting with this chatbot over here whether this chatbot is dumb or smart that's a different topic but i have integrated a chatbot okay so lg.com has a chatbot integrated into it now let's say you have a website with you and you also in, also want to integrate a similar chatbot but in order to make this chatbot you might think that you might need coding knowledge right and all of that well not a worry you can use this service called language service and your what will happen is automate uh, there are auto, uh, there are pre built ai models that will create those chatbots for you and integrate it into any website that you want okay so without any coding knowledge let's say you are completely new to the field of programming you don't know any coding language at all well, you can just go to this service there there are ready made ai models and it will go ahead and build those conversational interfaces or in other words it will go ahead and build those chatbots for you okay apart from that for example let's say i have some reviews with me okay let's say i operate a cloud kitchen on zomato and on my cloud kitchen uh, people are buying food items and once they buy food items they can also leave their reviews now let's say there are a lot of reviews more than 1000 reviews now those reviews are written in different different languages right um and what i want to do is i want to analyze each of those reviews so that i can make my food items better okay so what i i need to do is i want to analyze these reviews which are in text format but the struggle for me is they could be written in different languages and so on and also there are a lot of reviews so i don't want to analyze them manually not a worry you can go to this service called language service and it will go ahead and analyze those text reviews for you it will do a lot of analysis like sentiment analysis is one thing so from those reviews it will tell you which review was positive which was negative okay and it does not matter in which language it was written this uh, particular service of azure will take care of that as well even if it's written in french language it will try to understand the review and analyze it fine so this was just the overview of the second category of service called language service talking about the third category called vision service so if you want to analyze images or if you want to analyze videos then in that scenario vision service will be ideal for you so let's say in uh, analyzing images what would i want to do let's say i want to identify exactly where do i have a face in the image or let's say i want to find out exactly where do i have different different objects in the image so it will tell me that okay in the bottom left hand side you have a building in the bottom right hand side you have a dog and so on okay uh, so uh, you can use this particular service for, for analyzing images you can also use it to analyze videos okay so let's say you want to find out in at which time stamp that means okay from 30 seconds up to 35 seconds in the image uh, you had a dog dancing in that video right so all of this analysis i want to do this analysis on video that up till which time stamp what was happening what were the people involved in it what were the objects shown in the background so on then uh, automatic caption generation all of that i can go ahead and do it with help of this service called vision service okay after that coming to the fourth category called speech service so this service you can use to convert speech from one language to another language so let's suppose we have a bilateral meeting going on between head of two countries let's say on one hand we have we have head of our country mr narendra modi on another hand we have head of russia mr putin okay and let's say bilateral meeting is going on between uh, modi and putin now you might you might have seen such a bilateral meeting in some of the videos and you might have observed that what happens is let's say putin uh, speaks in russian language uh and in order to understand what putin is speaking uh, uh modi would keep a ear piece in his ear and in that ear piece some translator would be trying to translate what putin is speaking and the translator translated into a language that modi understands and 
fine and then modi gets to know what putin is speaking similarly vice versa modi would speak in hindi and in order to understand what modi is speaking putin would try to have a earpiece in his ear and in that earpiece some translator will try to translate modi speech right but currently this process is being done manually by some translator what if that translator does some mistake he is a human at the end of the day okay so what if you want to make this speech translation process automatic with a much much higher accuracy well you can use this ai service of azure called speech service and with this you can translate speech from one language to another then moving on to the fifth category of service that azure offers called translator service so for example let's suppose we have rajiv with us who has written who has published a book now what rajiv wants to make sure is rajiv wants to increase his book sales so what he is thinking is he has come up with this idea that why don't i launch my book in other countries as well but let's say rajiv has launched the book uh, in hindi well in other countries maybe with uh, hindi language books might not be sold that much so what he is thinking is he will translate that book that he has written into the language of that particular country so for example in spain he will try to launch that book in spanish language for a french country uh, he will try to translate that book in french language and so on and that is how he wants to launch that book in different different languages well he can hire a, a manual uh, translator a person who can do this work but that person could take a lot of time and and at the end of the day there is a risk maybe that person does some mistake in the translation so what if you varaji wants to do the translation automatically okay uh, in that case uh, he can use this particular service called translator service and it will help him to translate text from one language to another remember the speech service is used to translate speech from one language to another whereas the translator service is used to translate text from one language to another coming to the next service or next category called content safety category or content safety service what does this offer so here you have ready made ai models and what what do those ai models do let's understand so let's suppose rajiv has launched his youtube channel and in that youtube channel he comes live every night and he tries to teach something to his subscribers okay so he does live videos every day so let's say rajiv has launched his youtube channel wherein he does his live videos every day now what rajiv wants to make sure is in the chat section yes people can leave their comments right but what he wants to make sure is that none of the comment in his youtube uh, video is inappropriate there are no bad words used and all things like that well he can hire a chat moderator he can hire a person who will act as a chat moderator and that person will do the job for him right he will go through each comment one by one each live comment that is being received and if he feel if that chat moderator feels that this comment is inappropriate then the chat moderator would delete it or he would do some other action well what if there are a lot of comments uh on his youtube channel coming at uh, coming in every second it might get tedious for that chat moderator to do that work manually instead of that you can use this category of service called content safety and it will make sure that it tries to monitor um whatever data is being sent to it and it tries to see if there is anything inappropriate or offensive it will try to flag it to you okay fine so this is another category of service called content safety category fine moving on to the next category called search service your what does it do let's try to understand well your it does two things okay it tries to analyze information about images and it also tries to analyze information related to any text you might ask me smith in order to analyze text i already had my language service in order to analyze images i already had my vision service so what special does the search service do well yes through vision service you can analyze images but it only analyzes predefined it only analyzes predefined entities like for example it would analyze things like um what is the uh, what the what, what are the different objects shown in the image right so for example uh, it can only identify things like dogs buildings human car 
and some other specified entities. So whatever it tries to analyze is within the predefined entity list only. Okay. Similarly, in order to analyze text, we have language service, which helps us to analyze text. But here also it only analyzes predefined entities. So for example, yes, on the text, it will do sentiment analysis saying that that text has a uh, which type of language it is written in a happy language, mixed language or sad language. Okay, so with the, all of these things it will try to identify. Uh, there are other analysis that also it will try to do. But everything that it analyzes within the predefined list or okay, it is within that predefined entity list. What if you want to do analysis on image, but and you want to do analysis on text, but you want to analyze on custom entities? Okay, you want to customize what you want to analyze. In that scenario, you can use this search service. And with help of search service, you can search for your custom information, whether it is finding that custom information in an image or whether it is finding that custom information in a text. Okay, so fine. Uh, remember that. Um, Search service is used to analyze images and is used to analyze text. Yes, we can analyze image using vision service also, but it only analyzes predefined entities, whereas search service can analyze, analyze custom entities as well. Okay, similarly in language service, yes, we can analyze text, but it only analyzes predefined entities, whereas with search service, we can do the same thing, but we can also analyze custom entities as well. Okay, moving on to the next category of services. So you have open AI service, then you have Phi 3 uh, service. What does it do? So guys, both of these services are launched by open AI only. Open AI is a company that has made chat GPT as a product. You would know that. So what open AI has done is that they have tied up with Azure and they have made their open AI models available in the Azure platform. Okay. So you're in this category called Azure open AI service. You have access to large language models, whereas in the other category on the left hand side, you have access to small language models. Okay. What is the difference between a large language model and a small language model? Where a large language model uh, involves a lot of uh, a lot of computations behind the scene. Okay. And large language model is um, preferable if uh, let's say you are handling complex tasks. Okay. Uh, like let's say I want to basically ask it that I want to ask my chat GPT service, let's say that which talk to buy. Maybe you will have to scan through all the uh, documents that it was feeded into that particular model. And from that document, it will say that, okay, buy uh, HDFC stock now. Okay, so fine. So in order to do that task, it might be a little complex for it. More mathematical computations will be needed. Okay, so fine. You can use this large language model over here available through this service. But what will happen is large language models involve more cost as well. So let's say what if you want to do a simple task? Okay, what if you want to do a simple task? Like let's say you want to summarize an essay. It's a simple task, not a uh, uh, comparatively. Uh, it won't involve a lot of computations in the back end. If you want to do that simple task, you can use this small language model as well. Okay, it will uh, do less number of computations with less number of computations. The cost will also be less. Okay, remember that both these services don't use AI models behind the scene. They try to use Gen AI models. Now, what is the difference between AI and Gen AI? Okay, see all the other cat all the other services have AI models in them. Whereas these two services that I've circled use Gen AI models. What is the difference between AI and Gen AI? Let's try to understand it. The basic difference between AI and Gen AI. So guys, let's understand. So in AI models, yes, we can make a AI model. To make a AI model, there are two important notes that you need to keep in mind. The ones that we saw earlier. First note was that in order to create an AI model, you need to have some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Second note that we uh, saw was the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Feature columns are those columns that help me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. So let me talk about the target column in the AI models. Well, your target column in the AI model can be of two types. 
either it can be of discrete nature or either it can be of continuous nature discrete nature means a column having finite set of possibilities continuous nature means a column having infinite set of possibilities i repeat discrete nature means a column having finite set of possibilities continuous nature means a column having infinite set of possibilities so in a ai model your target column can be discrete in nature and within discrete it can be of two types it can have numeric values in them and it can also have non numeric values in them an example of a discrete numeric column would be something like dice roll so in dice roll let's have a column like dice roll this is my target column let's say and here what i am doing is whatever value i get when i roll the dice that value i am storing it in this column so let's say when i first roll the dice i get the value 6 then when i roll the dice i get the value 3 then when i roll the dice i get the value 6 and so on so now shubham you are uh, answer this one thing buddy this dice roll column is it of discrete nature or continuous nature what do you think is it of discrete nature or continuous nature shubham says it is of discrete nature that means it has finite set of possibilities correct shubham and within discrete this column has numeric values or non numeric values what do you think this column has numeric or non numeric values shubham says we have numeric values absolutely so is such a discrete numeric column allowed as a target yes it's allowed as far as ai model is concerned you can have a discrete numeric column as your target column let's take another example suppose we have a column like gender okay wherein i am storing the gender value of every employee in my office let's say the first employee had a gender of male next employee had a gender of female the next employee had a gender of female and so on okay now let me ask this question to rajiv rajiv this column called gender is it of discrete nature or continuous nature or in other words does it have finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities what do you think rajiv then we have achuta achuta what do you think so prince says this column called gender has finite set of possibilities so prince is saying that it is of discrete nature okay and within discrete uh, does it have numeric values or non numeric values this column for gender does it have numeric or non numeric values pradeep says that it has non numeric values so is such a discrete non numeric column allowed as my target column in ai model yes it's allowed okay now coming to continuous nature so guys if your target column is of continuous nature then it can only contain numeric values within it as far as creating a ai model is concerned a ai model only supports continuous numeric target column whereas a continuous non numeric target column is not supported an example of continuous numeric target column would be something like stock price wherein i am storing the price of a stock after every day okay so let's say i have a stock price column now in this stock price column pradeep do we have a uh, finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities in other words is this stock price column discrete in nature or continuous in nature pradeep what do you think pradeep says it has infinite set of possibilities so this stock price column is of continuous nature fine so and within continuous does it have numeric values does this column have numeric values yes so is such a numeric is such a continuous numeric column allowed as my target column yes it's allowed but if you have a continuous non numeric target column such a target column is not allowed for creating a ai model ai model cannot handle a continuous non numeric target column okay ai model cannot handle continuous non numeric target column continuous non numeric target column an example of non numeric target column would be something like let's say uh, youtube comments so let's say i want to predict uh, the youtube comment that will be made on rajiv's youtube channel okay now there are different comments that anyone can leave someone can just enter hi someone say someone can say a good video and so on like that there are different different youtube comments and someone can post 
Now, this YouTube comments column, does it have finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities? If YouTube comment column was my target column, this target column has finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities. What do you think? Shubham says infinite set of possibilities. Correct. So we can say that this YouTube comment column is a continuous column. And within it, do we have numeric values or non-numeric values? We have non-numeric values. Is such a continuous non-numeric column allowed as my target column? Achyuta, what do you say? Is such a continuous non-numeric column allowed as my target column in AI? Is it allowed as my target column in AI? It's not allowed, guys. A normal AI model cannot handle a continuous non-numeric target column. Huh, Rajiv, that it can allow. I have mentioned na, continuous numeric column it can allow as target. But continuous non-numeric column it cannot allow. Okay. A traditional AI model does not handle continuous non-numeric target column values. In order to avoid this, this, this limitation of AI, in order to overcome this limitation of AI, Gen AI was made. The purpose of making Gen AI was to allow continuous non-numeric target column as well. A AI model does not, not allow continuous non-numeric target column, whereas a Gen AI model does allow it. So Gen AI model was Gen AI field was just made for that to overcome this uh, disadvantage of AI. Gen AI field was made. Gen AI field in Gen AI field the model that you make can handle okay it can handle continuous non numeric target column so pradeep what is uh, a thing that we can do with gen ai but cannot do with ai so what is this gen ai Okay, so Pradeep, can I say that in a normal AI model, we cannot have a continuous non-numeric target column, whereas in a Gen AI model, we can have a continuous non-numeric target column. Okay, we can handle continuous non-numeric target column. Fine, so remember that these two services that are offered by Azure have Gen AI models in them, whereas the other services have normal AI models. The first two services contain Gen AI models in them. Okay, fine. All right. So now if anybody asks you the difference between AI and Gen AI, I, ho I hope it will be clear to you. This is the simplistic difference between AI and Gen AI. Okay, fine. How would you make that AI model technically? How would you make that Gen AI model that we are not covering in this uh, session? Okay. In this session, we are just covering ready-made models uh, that are made by Azure. Okay, fine. But uh, if you ask that, okay, how would you create a AI model through code manually? How would you create a Gen AI model through code manually? That's a different topic. Okay. In today's session, which is on AI 900, our goal is to cover ready-made AI models. We won't be cre creating any AI model on our own. We'll just be using these ready-made AI models. Okay. Fine. Uh, all right. Let's go ahead, guys. And uh, what I will do is, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's session, we have, I will show you the demo of three services today. First is the speech service. Second is the vision service. Third is document intelligence service. Let's start with speech service. So what I will do is I will create a folder over here. I'll create a folder in my file explorer. Let me create that folder over here. So I'll go to D drive or let me go to during delivery folder here i'll create a folder called july webinar and what i will do is um in this folder i will try to have some coding files in those coding files i will just mention the code to use these ready-made ai models okay I won't be creating any AI model on my own. I'll just be writing the code to use these AI models. Okay, fine. Let's see. So what I will do is I will try to launch a tool called Visual Studio Code. So let me try to launch that cool code. Let me try to launch that tool over here called Visual Studio Code. That is the tool through which I'll be writing my code. Okay. And you can see that tool has been launched. 
and in this tool i will uh, through this tool i'll start writing some code all right let me have a first folder over here called speed service so first i'm going to show you a demo of speed service within this folder let me have a coding file called test.py .py is a file extension that you use if in your coding file you are going to write your code in python programming language here in this current scenario i'm going to write code in python programming language so let me do it now in order to use the speed service i will have to create a resource of speed service in azure it's a rule that whenever you are trying to use any service of azure not just any ai service you take any service of azure whenever you are trying to use any service of azure if you want to use that service then in order to use that service you will have to create a resource of that service okay you will have to create a resource of that service so fine let's do that let's go to azure's portal and here i want to use the speed service so i will go ahead and i will create a resource of it fine so let me try to search for speed service over here you can see speed service does occur in my search result so i will i will try to click on that option of speed service in my search result and since i want to use the speed service i will go ahead and i will try to create a resource of it so in order to create a resource i will go ahead and click on the create button let me click on it and when i do that i am redirected to a form that i have to fill so let me go ahead and let me fill in the details of the form the first field in the form is asking me for subscription remember that in your azure account you can have more than one subscriptions with you so for example currently my azure account is called smitsha397 at gmail.com in this azure account i can have more than one subscriptions each subscription would have different set of permissions assigned to it and each subscription could have different amount of money uploaded into it so for example let's say pradeep is a ceo of a company and what pradeep wants to do is pradeep wants to make sure that he creates different azure subscriptions for his employees in the company so that his employees can also try to use the azure portal so what he can do is for a employee of the it service he can create uh, one subscription for a employee of hr team he can create another subscription and so on now for that person in the it team he will give access to all the services of azure whereas for someone in the hr team the subscription that he will create for that person in the hr team uh, maybe that person in the hr team does not need access to all the services of azure so he will restrict access to only few services okay like that so in each subscription you can have different amount of permission set that in this subscription what all uh, services are allowed to you to use and so on similarly in each subscription uh, you can upload different amount of money for example in the first subscription since it's going to be used by a person in the it team you can insert some you can uh, uh, deposit 100 dollars of credit whereas the second subscription was created for someone in the hr team maybe the hr team won't be using azure portal that much so let's say i'm using i'm uh, uh, depositing let less amount of money let's say i'm depositing only 5 dollars worth of credits and so on so in each subscription you can have different amount of permission set to it and you can have different amount of money deposited into it however currently in my azure account i have only one active subscription with me previously i had many active subscriptions but then i deleted those i deactivated those other subscriptions so currently i have only one active subscription with me so i have no other option but to choose that one so let me choose that subscription then it is asking me to select a resource group remember we are creating a resource of the speed service in azure there is a rule that whatever resource you create of any service has to fall within some of the other resource group i repeat in azure there is a rule that whenever you create any whenever you create any resource of azure you that resource has to fall within some of the other resource group now it has to fall within some of the other resource group okay what are the benefits of a resource group let's understand however remember that it's a it's mandatory that your resource has to fall within some of the other resource group what are the benefits let's understand let's suppose you are working on a project in your office 
and for that project you are creating multiple resources let's say the first resource is a resource of sql service of azure let's say the second resource is a resource of some ai service of azure and so on let's say like that you have created 20 resources now let's assume that after 6 months the project got over and now these resources are of no use for you so what you can do is you can go ahead and delete these resources one by one so that no cost is deducted from your subscription so what you can do is you can go to each resource one by one and click on the delete button to delete these resources you can go ahead and do that but going into each of the 20 resources one by one and then clicking on the deleting delete button manually could be a tedious process instead why don't we have these resources that belong to the same project inside of the same resource group why don't we have these resources that belong to the same project inside the same resource group and when the time for deletion comes instead of deleting the resources one by one individually you can directly delete the entire resource group with that all the resources in that resource group will automatically get deleted in one go it's just like this that if i try to delete a folder automatically all the different files in the folder will get deleted just like that if i try to delete a resource group all the different resources in that resource group will get automatically deleted so resource group helps for better life cycle management okay that is the first benefit what is the second benefit let's see so let's say you had a project in your office for which you created 20 resources now you want to calculate the total cost incurred by your project so you can go into each resource one by one and see the individual cost and you can say that okay for the first resource uh, azure charged you 10 dollars for the second resource azure charged you 9.1 dollars and so on like that you can go into each resource one by one see the individual cost at the end you will have to take the sum of all the cost and that's how you will arrive at the total cost incurred by the project as a whole but instead of doing this process which could be tedious see going into each resources one by one seeing the individual cost then at the end taking the sum of all the individual costs could be a tedious process instead why don't we have these resources that belong to the same project inside the same resource group inside the same resource group and when the time for cost calculation will come i can directly go to the resource group and with a single click of the button i can see the entire cost of all the resources in that resource group just by a single click of the button okay so resource uh, resource group helps for better cost management as well there are other benefits of resource group as well but uh, in short remember resource group helps for better management of resources nothing else now you can either create a new resource group or you can select a existing resource group also let's go ahead and let's create a new resource group we will go ahead and we'll create a new resource group over here let's see so i'll create a new resource group called webinar rg after that it is asking me to choose a region for my resource make sure to choose a region closer to your user just for better latency so it is asking over here that this resource should be deployed in a server of which region should it be deployed in a server of east us region or should it be deployed in a server of central india region and so on okay so you can choose the region of your choice make sure to choose the region closer to your user just for better latency nothing else fine uh, so let me choose over here uh, let me choose a region called south central us is there a region called south central us yes we have it okay fine then next it is asking me to assign a name to my resource so let me give it a name i will assign it a name saying webinar speech webinar speech resource make sure that the name that you give is unique okay across azure if you don't give a unique name then you will get an error just like i encountered this error saying that it says that this error uh, this name has already been taken by someone else so make sure that you give a unique name okay fine and over here i can see a tick mark next to the name that i have just now given which suggests that this is a unique name and it, it can be accepted by azure after that it is asking me to choose the pricing tier for the resource there are two pricing tiers available free and standard 
with the free tier, you won't be charged anything for usage. However, there will be a limitations that up till how many times you can use the resource. Whereas the standard tier, yes, the uh, cost you will have to pay, but there will be no limitations on usage. So let me choose standard tier. Yes, some costs will be deducted, but that's fine for me. Now I will directly jump to review plus create by clicking on this button over here called review plus create. And in the background, Azure will run a validation just to check whether it can give me the things that I'm asking for. If the validation is successful, the create button will be enabled. And now you can see validation was successful because of which the create button has been enabled. Let me click on it. And with that, what will happen is a resource of the speech service will be created. Once this resource is created, how to use that resource, I will show that to you. So let us just wait for one or two minutes. And within one or two minutes, the resource of the speech service will be created. Remember, currently, um, these resources might suffer from availability issues. Okay. That means uh, in the region in, in which we have deployed the resource, if there is a lot of traffic, Sometimes uh, we might not be able to access the resources, but usually that uh, availability issue is I have observed that it's in East US region. However, I've chosen a different region, right? South Central US I had chosen. Uh, in that region, I have not observed any availability issues as such, any traffic related issues. So hopefully it should work fine for today. Uh, but let's say if we encounter traffic related issues over there also, we'll have to deploy a resource in a different region. Okay. So you'll still be able to see the demo. I just hope that in this region, the one that we have chosen, we don't suffer, we don't suffer from any traffic related issues or any availability issues. Okay. Anyways, let me go to the resource. Now, in order to use the resource, you have two ways. One is you can use the resource directly without needing to mention any code. So you can launch the speech studio and use the resource directly. Another way is by using code. Okay. And that's the way that I'll be showing you in today's session. Because see, without code approach, anybody can do it. You can just go to the speech studio. There will be a button to convert speech from one language to another. Fine, you can use it. However, let me show you another way of using the speech resource, which is, which is through code. Okay, so I'll be writing some code through which I'll be trying to access the speech resource. And with it, I'll be trying to convert speech from one language to another. So what will be my flow? So what the speech resource will do is, it will take the speech as input. It will do the translation, but that translation, it will first uh, do it in text format. Okay, so in other words, what it will do is, first it will take the speech. Okay, let's say if that speech is in English language, so I'll just enter over here. If that speech is in English language, it will convert that speech. It will convert that speech to text format. Then after converting it to text format, it will convert that text to a text of different language, whether it is converting it into Hindi language or French language or whatever. Then after converting it to text language, uh, after converting it, uh, it to a text of different language, what it will do is it will convert that text to speech again. So in between, remember the sub steps that are involved. So yes, you will observe that we are converting speech from one language to another, but in between there are these other sub steps as well that the speech service that the speech resource will do that the resource of the speech service will do. Okay, fine. Anyways, my end goal is to convert my speech from one language to another. There are two ways in which you can use the speech resource. One is without code. Second is with code. Currently, let me show you the with code approach. So first, in order for me to uh, gain access to the resource with code, uh, or in other words, I can say in order for me to work with the resource with code, first I have to gain access to it. Okay. So what I will do is I will write some code to gain access to my speech resource. Let's see uh, what I will do. So the first thing that I need is the key of the resource. The first thing that I need is the key of the resource. So let me go ahead and let me mention the key. So how to get the key? I'll just go to the resource and in the overview section itself, you can observe the key. Okay, in the overview section itself, you can observe the key. If you do not see it in the overview section, what happens is in every resource, there is always a key and endpoint option in every resource. You can click on that and you can obtain information about the key and endpoint. What is endpoint? 
endpoint is nothing but the link through which you can uh, it is the link through which someone can access the resource okay endpoint is nothing but the link so for example uh, the link for azure is azure.portal sorry portal.azure.com right just like that the link for this particular resource is uh, southcentralus.api.microsoft.com you can see this full link over here fine anyways uh, so you can access the details from the overview section Okay, if the overview section you do not see it, always in any resource there will be key and endpoint section present. You can explore that key and endpoint section also. Okay, so there are two things that are needed to gain access to the resource. First is the key of the resource. Currently, you can see two keys shown to you over here. Just like for our house, in order to open the lock of our house, we have two keys, right? What's the usage of that second key? It's just there for backup. Correct? So just like for our house, we create two keys. So that uh, if one key gets lost, at least you can use the second key. So that purpose of second key is for backup. Similarly, over here, you have two keys to access the resource. The second key is for backup purposes. However, you can use any one of them. Okay. It's just that one more key is given to you apart from that primary key. So that if anything happens to that primary key, you can use the second one. Okay, so you can use any one out of these keys over here. Both will work. Just like if, if for our house, we have created two keys. You can use any one out of these two keys and you will be able to open the lock of your house. Similarly, we can use any one out of the two keys of our resource over here and will able to open the lock of our resource. So let me take help of any of these keys over here. Okay, and I will mention it in my code. The second thing that I need in order to gain access to the speech resource is the region in which the resource will lie. So let me copy that region and mention it in my code. So I will say, that this is the region in which the resource lies. Okay, with the help of these two things, I will be able to gain access to my resource. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, let me see whether I am able to gain um, access uh, to my resource or not. Okay, so we'll try to see over here. So uh, what I will do, is I will have to import a Python library for the same. So I will say from the Azure folder, there is a subfolder called Cognitive Services. Inside that subfolder, I have a file called speech. And from that file, uh, and what I want to do is, or it's not a file actually, it's a subfolder only. So from Azure folder, there is a subfolder called Cognitive Services. Inside that subfolder, we have another subfolder called speech. I will just refer this as speech SDK. Now, inside that subfolder called speech, which I have renamed as speech SDK, inside that subfolder, I have a file called translation. And inside that file, I have a Python class called speech translation config. I have a Python class called speech translation config. And what this class will do is, it will help me to gain access to my speech resource. In order to gain access to my speech resource, I will have to pass two things. First is the key of my resource, and second is the region in which the resource lies. So let me pass the two things to this Python class over here. First is the key of my resource, second is the region in which the resource lies. Okay, with this, I will gain access to the resource. And if this line of code works properly, I don't get any error. That's the signal that I have gained access to the resource. So in the next line, I will say that access to resource has been granted. Access to resource has been granted. So in this sixth line over here, I've written the code to gain access to the resource. If this sixth line works properly, then the Python compiler will move to the seventh line. If at all, while gaining access to the resource in the sixth line itself, I received an error, then the execution of the compiler will stop at that line itself. It won't go to the upcoming lines. It won't go to the upcoming lines. Fine. So the fact that if the compiler goes to the upcoming line, that's a sign that, okay, the previous line worked properly and I've gained access to my speech resource. Okay, let's go ahead and let's try to run our code. I can do it by clicking on this run button over here. For the first time when I'll click on it, uh, it will ask me to choose the Python interpreter. 
let me choose python interpreter of 3.11 version after choosing it let me now run again and you can see it uh, gives me a message saying access to resource has been granted now let's do it uh, let's go ahead and let's write the code to use the speech resource so first what i will do is i will tell to my speech resource that i'm going to give you a input speech which will be in english language okay so i will say that the speech that i will give to you will be in english language let me write the code for that i will say the speech that i am going to give to you will be in english language okay so i have written the uh, code for it that okay i am going to speak in english language fine now i want my resource uh, i want to communicate to my resource that fine okay my input speech will be in english language but my output speech will be in which languages so let me mention my output languages as well okay let me mention my output languages as well so where i'll just mention to my resource after gaining access to the resource i will tell it that please take these target languages so i might want to translate speech from english to hin uh, for to hindi so i will enter a code for hindi called hi i might also want to translate a speech from english to french so i will write a code for french called fr i might also want to translate speech from english to spanish so i will write a code for spanish called es and so on like that for different different languages there are different different codes and you can go ahead and mention it okay fine let's move forward now what i will do is i will uh, go ahead over here and uh, i will have to first ask uh, the uh, my tool my visual studio tool to take input from the user that in which target language do you want to convert the speech do you want to convert the speech from english to hindi do you want to convert the speech from english to french do you want to convert the speech from english to spanish so here i will ask the user to enter its input i will say please enter input or please enter the target language of your choice okay i will say if you want to convert it to french language enter fr if you want to convert it to hindi language enter hi and uh, if you want to convert it to spanish language enter es let's see whether it is taking that input correctly or not let's see and fine you can see a text is being uh, asked to me saying enter a target language all right i'll do one thing instead of showing this text in one line i will show it in uh, separate separate lines so let me enter the code to insert a new line over here in between okay so i will say after this text called language enter a new line after this text called french enter a new line after this text called hindi enter a new line and so on and now what i will do is i'll try to run the code again let's see what happens i'll try to run the code hopefully now it should uh, show me that entire sentence in different different lines and you can see it does that okay fine and it is asking me for some input so i can enter any input that i want okay fine and even that input i want to take it into a new line only so i'll write the code for that fine so let's go ahead and let's run the code again and let's see what happens so now you can see it is asking me to enter a target language and that input instead of asking me to enter an input over one second instead of asking me for that input over here it is asking me in, in a new line okay fine so i will enter something of my choice whatever i enter let's say if i want to convert it to spanish spanish language i'll enter the code of es that input that the user is giving i want to save it in this variable so let me go ahead and let me save it in this variable i have done that now what i am going to say in my code is if the target language mentioned by the user if the target language mentioned by the user is any of the three specified target languages then only do the translation otherwise don't do the translation okay so i am going to say that if the target language entered by the user is any of the three specified target languages then only do the translation or else do not do the translation just move forward so i'll mention a code called pass pass means don't do anything just like uh, in our uh, childhood uh, we used to play that game wherein if we just 
say pass uh, then that means i don't want to do that task i'm giving it to some other person right so that pass means i myself don't want to do anything so, so what i am saying over here is if the target language entered by the user is any of the three specified target languages then only go forward otherwise don't move forward okay so if the target language mentioned by the user is any of the three specified target languages then i want to do my translation in order to do my translation first i will have to take my input right so let me go ahead and uh, let me take um that speech input that speech input um uh, i will give it from my microphone so i will just enter the settings for that i'm going to say that uh, i'm going to take a speech so for that i will speak through my default microphone only i will say use default microphone equal to true so that speech that will be recorded will be recorded from my default microphone so this is the audio setting that i have done okay now uh, what i want to do is i want to make my resource ready to do the speech translation so i will write a code over here to make my uh, speech resource ready to do the translation i want to wake it up in order to do that what i will do is from the azure folder there is a subfolder called cognitive services within it there is a subfolder called speech which i have named as speech sdk inside that subfolder i have a file called translation and inside that file i have a class called translation recognizer with this i will just wake up the resource and i will ask it to be ready which resource i want to wake up i have already gained access to the resource that particular resource i want to wake up okay and i will uh, tell my resource that uh, i will be passing a speech to you and that speech will be recorded from my default microphone so i have already written the code that okay i am recording my speech through my default microphone that particular setting i will just pass it to my resource saying that okay uh, the resource that i have gained access to please wake up because i am going to give you a speech from my default microphone okay so please be ready to do the translation fine with this what will happen is my resource will be ready to do my translation over here it will be ready to do my translation once it's ready i will ask the user that okay please speak now whatever you want to translate please speak okay so once the resource is ready i will just ask it to speak now okay so i will ask it to speak then then based on what it speaks we will try to do the translation over here okay based on what it speaks we will try to do the translation fine let's see uh, so once i am asking the user that okay speak now the resource is ready to do the translation okay so fine uh, resource will take that speech it will do the translation and those translation results okay i want to get it so in order to get those translation results i will write this code over here i will say recognize the speech in one go recognize the speech in one go okay recognize it in one go and uh, then do the translation and i want to get those I, and i want to get the results of that translation so i am saying to my resource that okay you are ready to do the translation recognize my speech in one go and then whenever uh, once you recognize it in one go do the translation and then get me the results of the translation back to me okay get me the results of the translation back by default what this resource will do is it will do the translation in all the three specified target languages but i only wanted to do the translation in one language right but by default here you will see the results for all the specified target languages let me show you that that by default what the resource does is it does the translation in all the specified target languages but what i want to do i only want to do the translation in one language let's see for that what i will do okay. i will run the code again and you can see it is asking me to enter a target language i will enter it i will say hindi let's suppose then what it will do is it will ask me uh, to speak and i will also be speaking something okay let's see hello i am in a session of artificial intelligence okay and you can see my translation result okay what it has done is it has translated it into all the three uh, target languages you can see the translation for hindi language similarly you can see the translation for french language 
and you can also see the translation for your Spanish language. So as I mentioned, the resource does the translation in all the three specified target languages. But fine, I only want the translation in uh, my language. How to do it? Let's see. Okay. By the way, first of all, what I will do is first of all, I'll mention my original speech. So I will just say my original speech is so and so. Original speech is so and so. Okay. I will get my original speech over here and I will just print it out. Then from the results, what do I want? I want to get the translated uh, version, but I, but the resource does the translation in all these specified target languages. I only want the translation in my specified target language. So I'll say from the res uh, results, yes, we have obtained translations, but I only want the translation in my specified target language. The one that I inputted, I only want the translation in that specified target language. Okay. And for that specified target language, give me the translated text. And whatever is the translated text, I just want to go ahead and uh, print it to you guys. That what is that translated text? What is that translated text? Okay, so it will just print it over here. Let's see if that is working. I'll just go ahead and show you that. So let me run the code. It is asking me to enter a target language. So I will enter a target language of my choice. Let's say it's Hindi. Then it will ask me to speak something. So I'll also speak. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Okay. So you can see my original text was hello. Good morning. How are you? And it has translated it into Hindi. Okay. Fine. Now, but that is not what my end goal was. My end goal was that, okay, we'll have a speech in, uh, let's say, we'll have a speech in, let's say, English language. I want to convert that speech, let's say, to Hindi language. In between, we know what this resource will do. It will convert that speech from Hindi English language to text of English language. After converting it to text of English language, it will convert it to the text of the language that you want. Let's say I want to convert it into Hindi. So it will convert that text from English language to Hindi language. Then that text, we want to convert it to speech back. So up till now, the first three steps have been done by me. The last step is yet to be done. I want to convert this translated text to speech again. Okay. In order to convert it to speech, I will have to use some of the voices that are already made in Azure. Okay. So in Azure, it has made many, many voices. Let me go ahead and let me show you the voices. Okay. Let me show you the voices. Voice support. That's it. In Azure. Okay. So in order to do that translation, uh, let me show you that or let me just write it over here. Ah. So for speech service, there are different, different voices. Okay. So let's say I want to convert a text to speech. There are different voices. So for example, for Hindi language, we have these voices for our neural, Mardur neural, Arav neural and so on. Each will have different pitch to it. Okay, so some voice will be very soft. Some voice will be will have a more bass, like like for example, how Amitabh Bachchan speaks, right? More bass, more depth in the voice. Whereas uh, Sachin Tendulkar speaks softly. So like that, you have different different voice with different different bass settings and all. So you can choose the voice of your choice. Uh, your let me choose one voice. Let me choose um, Madhur Neural. Okay, so I'll just mention in my code. I'll just go ahead and mention in my code that as far as voices are concerned, for Hindi language, I want to use this particular voice. Then similarly, for French language, let's see what voice we have. For French language, you will see one of the voices will be Henry Neural. Still, let me search for it over here. And you can see one second for French language, Henry Neural should be there. Ah, you can see. For French language over here, we have many voices. One of them is Henry Neural. Okay, so let me get that voice code over here and let me mention it in my programming file. So I will say that for French language, use this particular voice. Similarly, at last, my last target language was Spanish. For Spanish, one of the languages is uh, one of the voices is Elvira Neural. So let me show you that. For Spanish, one of the languages is Elvira Neural. 
Like, let me directly search for it. Uh, you can see over here for Spanish language, one of the voices is Elvira Neuro. There are other voices as well that you can use. Let me use the voice of Elvira Neuro. Okay, I'll just copy this voice code and paste it in my programming file. So for Spanish language, I want to use this particular voice. Okay, fine. And now what, what all things I've done? I had my speech, which was originally in English language. I wanted to convert it into speech again, but of a different language, let's say Hindi. In between what the resource did, it converted that speech of English language to text of English language. Then that text of English language, it converted it to text of the target language of our choice, whether it is Hindi or something else. Okay, then this text, I want to convert it to speech back. Out of the four steps, the first three steps I'm done with. The last step I'm yet to do. Let's do it. So from text, let me convert it to speech. Okay. So what I will do is, I will just say, first of all, that which voice I want to use. So uh, let me go ahead and let me do that configuration in my resource. So I will just say over here that, I will just say that in this folder, or basically in this uh, library, you can say that I've imported, I will just call a class called speech config. There, I will just ask the resource that, okay, I'm going to do this uh, setting in you. I'm going to uh, tell my resource that which particular uh, voice to use. So in order to do that setting again, I will have to gain access to it. So in order to do that uh, configuration setting as well, let me gain access to it. So I'll pass the key of my resource and region of my resource. With this, I will gain access to perform some configuration changes. Okay, to perform configuration changes that which uh, voice I want to use or I will say access to select the voice. Once I have the access to select the voice, I will use that access and I will ask my resource to choose the voice that I want. Okay, so let me ask it. So I will say um, in order to convert text to speech, use this particular voice name. So I will choose that voice name based on the target language mentioned by the user. So if the target language mentioned by the user is HI, I want to use Madhur Neural Noise. If the target language mentioned by the user is FR, I want to use Henry Neural Voice and so on. So I will say based on the target language mentioned by the user, choose the voice of your choice. Okay. Once we have performed the, once we have communicated to the resource that, okay, this is the voice that we want to use. We'll ask the resource, which is ready to speak. We'll ask that resource over here to speak something. Okay. So fine. Let's go ahead and first let's uh, ask the resource to speak. Let's make it ready to speak. So in order to make it ready to speak, what I will do is from this library, I will call a class called speech synthesizer class. With this, the resource will be ready to speak. Okay, it will be ready to speak using the voice of my choice. It will be ready to speak. Once the resource is ready to speak, then I will uh, then I'll show you what to do. Once my resource is ready to speak, I will just say, please speak something so I can hear it. Okay, please speak something using the text that was given to you. And which text will give it? We'll give it this translated text. So take this text, convert it to speech and whatever is the speech result, I want to get it back so that I can hear it. That's it. Okay, let me go ahead and let me run the code. But before that, I'll do one thing because it will con because I want to take my speech, I want to convert it to speech of another language. So that speech of another language, I will be able to hear, but it will be through my systems audio. So to share my systems audio with you guys, what I will do is I will uh, try to share it in this way. I'll say share, but now while sharing, I will include my system audio as well. Let me do that. Also, I can see some uh, doubts in the chat. I'll try to address those doubts as well, but fine. Let me go ahead and let me try to run this code. Let's see whether it is working or not. It is asking us to enter a target language of our choice. Let's choose Hindi. Then it will ask me to speak. I'll speak something. Let's see. Hello, I am in a session of artificial intelligence. चलो मैं आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस के एक सत्र में हूं 
Okay, were you guys able to hear the voice back? Were you guys able to hear it? I'll answer those doubts in the chat. Yes, right. Okay, you were able to hear it. Fine. So this was the demo of our speech service, wherein we took our speech from one language to another. Okay. In fact, uh, instead of calling, instead of running this again and again, why don't I put this in a loop? Okay, so I will just put this uh, in a loop that while uh, let me put this in a loop over here. I'll say while the target language is in any of these three space. Okay, fine. Or without putting a loop, it's fine. I just wanted to show you the demo. Uh, so that's fine. In, in fact, what I want to show is with different, different languages. So what I'm thinking is, let me run the code again. Now I'll convert it to Spanish language. Okay, let's do it. So I will say, please convert from English to Spanish. Okay, so I will ask me to speak. I'll speak something. Hello, I'm in a session and with me we have Pradeep and Sandeep. Hola, estoy en una sesión y conmigo tenemos a Pradeep y Sandeep. Okay, and you can see it has done that translation over there. Fine. So like this, um, you can use the speech resource. Uh, remember, if I just give you my coding file, if you run this code in your uh, laptop, you will be able to uh, see the demo. So uh, make sure that in your coding file, the key that you mention is always hidden. Because if they get access to this key and the region in which your resource lies, they will be able to gain access to the resource. If anybody gains access to, be res to the resource, they can use the resource. And whatever charge will be deducted, it will be deducted from your subscription. So make sure that the key that you write is hidden. There are many ways to hide it, but fine, I'm not hiding it for now. Okay, so this was the demo of our first service. Now coming to the doubts. So over here, let me check the doubts from starting. Uh, Subham says, after seeing all these Azure services, I have a doubt that wouldn't these Azure models in these services affect the job of data scientists? Yes, it does, Shubham. It does. So maybe uh, previously, if, if there was a need of five data scientists, maybe now companies are hiring only three. Yes, so it does. Okay, but still, it's not that uh, they have completely stopped hiring. You still need some person who can uh, use these services. So yes, the demand has gone below. Okay, fine. Coming to the next doubt. Amul says, can we get recording? Yes, um, it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. Pradeep Prem says, how do we detect the language? Could you show? Detect the language? I think that uh, you mean what? Detect the language. As in, I didn't get. Detect the language. I didn't understand. Detect what you are speaking. See what what I'm currently doing is I'm already currently giving a message to my resource that it's going to be of English language. I am not letting the resource detect it automatically. I am detecting. I am just mentioning it myself. But if I want it to detect automatically, what to do? I will show you that other demo as well. Okay, in this demo, I didn't. Uh, the resource is not detect detecting my input speech. The resource already knows that it is going to be in English language. It is not detecting it. It knows that it is going to be of English language. But if you want to detect it, then how to do it? All of that we'll see. Okay, don't worry. I'll show you a separate demo as well for the same. Currently in this demo, I've done nothing like that. Okay, so in this demo, I won't be able to show, but in another demo, your doubt will be clear. Fine, any other doubts? Any other doubts? Uh, one student says, as we are adding multiple languages and using only one. Uh, see, Harsha, what happens is by default, the resource does translate into uh, all the target languages of your choice. So yes, the more target languages you use, the more costs will be incurred. That is going to be the case. So that's why you can see I only wanted to convert into three target languages. So I only mentioned three, but it has support for more than 100 target languages. Did I mention those 100? No. Why? to save on cost that I only mentioned the target languages that I am going to be using. Okay, so yes, you're absolutely right, buddy, that as you introduce more and more target languages, it will do more and more translation work. And with that, the cost will increase. 
okay that is going to happen we cannot avoid that so the only way to avoid uh, to to lesser the cost is make sure that you introduce less target languages so don't put any unnecessary target language that you are not going to use Umesh says, do we need an expert in programming? See, Umesh, uh, in order to use these resources, there are two ways. One is you can access the resource through code as well as without code as well. So if you just go through Speech Studio, you can access it without code as well. And with without code, you don't need any programming language, right? However, it's very easy. I mean, there will be some button over there. And through that, by clicking on that button, it will take the input speech. It will convert it to the target language of your choice. Anybody can do it. Who knows how to access the computer, they can do it. So you have that without code approach as well, as well as you have this with code approach as well. Okay, I usually like this with code approach option, but it's fine, it's up to you. So if, uh, using the coding, or if you use the coding approach, you will need some knowledge of programming language. However, there's a without code op option as well. You can go to the speech studio and there's a without code option as well. Okay. Fine. So I hope uh, your doubts got cleared. What we'll do now, guys, is we'll take a short uh, break. After the break, we'll come back and we'll move to the demo of other services. But up till now, guys, whatever we have covered, is it making sense? Did it make sense? How Azure charges? Is there any calculator? So uh, Umesh, uh, you can get an estimated cost from the documentation. But in order to see the exact cost, let me show that to you. Uh, Remember, Umesh, that what will happen is you cannot, I mean, Azure won't give you the um, cost right away. So, for example, currently some cost would have been deducted, right? Because I did some work on Azure. So, I'll go to cost management. I'll go to cost management. And here you can see the cost that was incurred, either by resource basis or by resource group basis, whatever you want to do. Okay, in fact, let me just go to cost analysis over here directly. Okay, so from under cost management, we have on, went to cost analysis and you can do it by resource, by resource group and so on. Uh, but remember that cost will be shown to you after a few hours. So this work that I have done, immediately the cost won't reflect over here in this cost analysis page. It will be shown to you after a few hours. So just to show to you, so I did one training batch, uh, very nice try to cover all the uh, AI 102 services. And let me show you the cost that was incurred. So I guess it was in June, if I'm not wrong. And uh, let me check here. What's up? Oh, or fine, I'll just try to do it with the help of services. Let me not search through resource group. Let me do it through services. Okay. Fine. So under cognitive services, we have speech. So you can see, I tried to show that demo in one of the batches and you can see what it charged me. Okay. It's hardly a, a rupee. It didn't even charge you that rupee. So you can see this, but this is not the live work that I've done. This current work that I've done, that cost will be shown to me after a few hours. Okay. But this month, I, I guess I did try to work on, I did try to show that demo of speech service in one of my training batches and you can see the cost that was incurred. It's, it is hardly a rupee. Okay. So the same demo that I showed to you over here, same demo I showed in my batch also, and it was hardly a rupee. So yeah, uh, it does not charge you that much. Okay. But yes, estimated cost you can see in the documentation page, uh, but no fixed cost, you will never be able to estimate. I mean, it, it varies depending on your usage, right? More you use, the more cost will be deducted. Also, uh, apart from usage, uh, the te uh, the speech that you are giving to the resource, if the speech is long, it will have to do more work. If the speech is short, it will have to do less work. That also matters. There are a lot of uh, variabilities. So yes, it will give you estimated cost in the documentation, but fixed cost, it will never give you. It varies on a lot of things, but you can see. Uh, the same work that I did in your batch, same work I've done in another batch also. And there you can see the cost that was incurred, hardly a rupee. Fine with that, I hope your cost um, doubt is cleared. Achutya says little complex. Ha, Achutya, see if you're using the coding option, you will need of uh, you will need knowledge of programming language. Okay, if that is not there, yes, uh, this might not make that much of sense. 
So that is a prerequisite if you're using the coding approach. But let's say if you do not know coding, there is a without coding approach also, as I showed you. To access each of these resources, there's a without coding approach as well. So you can use that. So that is a given that if you are going to use the with coding approach, the programming knowledge language has to be there. Okay, Omesh says in which scenario we use language translator. So Omesh, let's suppose, uh, okay, you are saying in which scenario we'll use this service called language uh, called translator service. That is what you are saying. Okay, so let's say you have written a book which has some text in it and that book you want to translate it into multiple languages. Well, you can go ahead and you can use help of this service called translator service. Okay, and it will convert that text from one language to another. And that text could be in any form of document, PDF document, and in any form of document, it will convert it from one language to another. Okay, any other doubts? Ashutya says the other one which you were saying without coding. Ha ha, yes, all you have to do is with a single click of the button, absolutely, you will be able to do that. Uh, anyone who would know how to just work with simple computers, they will be able to do it. Okay, with a single click of the button, it will say, okay, speak something, you will speak and it will convert it into the target language of your choice. Fine, so let's take a short break. After the break, we'll come back and uh, we'll move to other services. So let's take a 15 minute tea break and after that we'll be back guys. Till then, I'll just be on mute.
Welcome back to the session, everyone. Hope all of you are back after the break. Just put a confirmation in the chat whether you guys are back or not so that we can proceed. Everybody is back. Achutya, Umesh, Rajiv, yes, okay. Perfect. So let's move forward. So, guys, we have already seen a demo of speed service. Now it's time to see a demo of vision service. So in vision service, as I mentioned, we can go ahead and analyze images and videos. So let's see how to do that. Okay. So let's start by creating a resource of the vision service. So we'll go to our Azure portal. And there we'll try to search for vision service. Okay. And uh, currently, uh, you can observe over here, as far as vision service is concerned, you see two. First is custom vision and uh, second is your computer vision. What we'll do is we'll click on custom vision over here. Okay. And we'll try to click. Uh, we'll try to create a resource of this custom vision service. All right. Let me go ahead and let me create a resource of this. All right. Now in custom vision, guys, uh, how is custom vision separate from computer vision? Custom vision, uh, you get an option to create your own vision model as well. Okay, so for example, you can see you can go ahead and create your own vision model. Okay, so if you want to do it, you can go ahead and you can uh, do that. Okay, whereas in computer vision, there won't be option to create a new vision model. You can just go ahead and use the pre existing models that are already available. Okay, so remember that particular difference. Fine. So, for example, so I just show you computer vision service. And if I just go ahead and create a resource of it, here you won't see that option to create that new vision model and so on. All right. Uh, so, let's go ahead. And uh, what we would do is we'll try to create a resource of this service. So in order to do that, we have to fill up this form. First is subscription. We know that in our Azure account, we can have more than one subscriptions, each having different amount of uh, money uploaded into it and each having different permissions set into it. So you can select the subscription of your choice. However, for me, currently I have only one active subscription with me. So I have no other option but to choose that one. Next, we have a second field in the form which is asking us to select the resource group. Remember in Azure, there is a rule that whatever resource we create has to fall within some of the other resource group. So either you can create a new resource group or select an existing resource group that you have already created. Let me select an existing resource group. After that, it is asking me to select the region in which my resource will lie. So you can select any region of your choice. Make sure that you choose a region closer to your user. So if your user is in South Central US, make sure to choose a region closer to that. After that, it is asking me to give a name to my vision resource. So let me give it a name. So here, uh, what I will do is I'll give it a name saying webinar vision resource. Then it is asking me to choose the pricing tier for the resource. There are two uh, tiers available, free and standard. Okay, with free, yes, no cost will be deducted, uh, but there are a lot of restrictions as compared to uh, standard tier. Okay, with free tier, there are a lot of restrictions. So to avoid that, I will choose standard tier. Then I will just go ahead and ask Azure to review the details entered by me. If the validation is correct, I would want Azure to allow me to create. Your validation failed. Let's see what happened. Okay, I have not agreed to terms and conditions. Let me agree to it. After that, I will ask Azure to review the details entered by me. If the validation is okay, I would want Azure to allow me to create the resource. So currently a validation is being run in the backend. The validation was successful now because of which the create button has been enabled. Let me click on it. 
and with that a vision a resource of the vision service will be created remember there are two categories of visions of services over here one is custom vision another is computer vision with custom vision it allows you to create your own custom vision models as well with computer vision you can only use the existing vision models okay so just wait let's see Currently, the resource is being created. And what we'll do is we'll have to wait for one or two minutes. And after that, the resource will be created. And now you can see the resource has been created. OK, so what we would do is we'll go to the resource. Just to check if everything was OK. And now again, there are two ways to interact with the resource. One is without any code. So you can just go to the Vision Studio and uh, you can just interact with the vision resource without any code whatsoever. Second approach is with code. We'll use the second approach, okay? Uh, because without code approach, anybody can uh, would know without any training. Let's use the second approach, which is the coding approach. So how to interact with this resource with coding? Okay, let's go ahead and let's see that. So I'll go to Visual Studio Code tool. There I'll create a new folder. Let me create a new folder for vision service. And here I will try to have my coding file. Let me call it analyze images dot py. What I would also want is I would also want to have some uh, images with me. So let me go ahead and let me have some images with me over here. So what I would do is I'll just go ahead Look at those images. Let me show you how those images look like. Okay, so let me get those images over here. Okay. And now you will be able to see some of the images on which we'll be able, which will be doing the work. So I have three images with me. There's the first one, then the second one, then the third one. So over here, let's say I want to go ahead and perform analysis over it. How would I do it? Let's go ahead and let's learn that. So first, in order to use the vision resource, I will need to gain access to it, right? So in order to gain access to the resource, what I will have to do is uh, first, I will have to go ahead and mention the key of my resource. So let me do that. Let me mention the key of my resource. So I'll go to my resource and from there I will obtain the key. You can see currently two keys are shown to you. You can use any one of them. So let me take any one of the keys and paste the key in my coding file. So this is the first thing needed to gain authentication to the vision resource. With, uh, that first thing was the key of that resource. Second thing that you need is the link to the resource or the endpoint of the resource. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's copy the link to the resource or the endpoint of the resource. We'll copy this and we'll just go ahead and paste it over here in my coding file. Let's do that. Let's paste it in our coding file. Okay, using these two things, what will happen is I will gain authentication to the vision resource. So in order to do it, I will need help of a library which I will import. So I will say import from Azure folder. There is another subfolder called vision inside uh, that subfolder, I have a file called, uh, sorry, inside this folder called Azure, there is a, another subfolder called AI. Inside that folder, I have a file called vision and that file, I'm just importing it as SDK. I'm just giving a new name to the file called SDK. Now inside this file called vision, which I have renamed as SDK, what I want to, I would want to do is I would want to go ahead and uh, call a class called vision service options and through the class i will try to gain authentication to the vision resource the first thing that i need in order to gain authentication is the endpoint of the resource second thing that i'll need to pass is the key of my resource let me pass these two things and with this i'll gain access to my resource okay access to the vision resource okay so if this code works properly uh, without any error that's the indication that access to the resource has been granted Let's go ahead. Let's see whether uh, it has been granted or not. So we'll just go ahead and we'll try to print this message that access to resource has been granted. 
Okay. So over here, I've written the code for authentication on the sixth line. If that line works properly, my compiler will go to the seventh line and say that access has been grounded. If in the sixth line where I'm trying to gain authentication, there is some error, then the compiler won't go ahead and just stop at that line itself. And this particular statement will not get printed. Fine, let's see uh, whether that happens or not. So currently I'm inside of this folder called vision service. I'll try to open my terminal over there. So now my, my terminal is pointing to vision service folder. There I will say, please run this coding file. There are multiple ways to run it. First is by clicking on the run button. Okay. Second is you can say here, I want to run a Python file called analyze images.py. So that is another way also. Okay. That's another way. Uh, currently it says no such thing there. Why does it say no such thing there? Uh, analyze images. Huh. Spelling was wrong. Analyze. A-S-E. Okay. A-N-A-L-Y-S-E. That is the name. Okay, currently over here while importing, I have a error. It says that uh, there is no such attribute called vision service options. I'm just wondering whether I used incorrect spelling or something like that. Or some other issue has occurred totally. Mm. Or let me use a different uh, class. If I'm not wrong, I should use this class called uh, image analysis client. Let me do that. I'll try to use a different library. Fine, so let me do that. Okay, so I'll say from Azure folder, there's a subfolder called AI. Inside that subfolder, uh, we have another subfolder. Inside that subfolder, let's have a subfolder called vision. And inside that subfolder, I have a file called image analysis. Image analysis. And uh, from that file, I will try to import this class called image analysis client. And this is the one that I'll use for doing authentication. Right now it should work. So first thing that I'll pass is the endpoint of my resource. So I'll pass the endpoint of my resource normally. The second thing that it will need is the key of my resource, but I can't pass the key directly. I will have to pass it over here in the form of a function. So let me import that function. So I will say from Azure folder, there is another subfolder called core. From that, there is a file called credentials. And inside that file, I have a function called Azure key credential. Through this function, you can go ahead and pass your key. Uh, here, as per the document expectation, we cannot pass the key directly. We'll have to pass it through this function. So we'll go ahead and do that. Let's pass it with the help of this particular function over here. Okay. That's it. And with this access to the resource should be granted. Let's check. Okay. Currently, I hope there's no syntactical error that I'm doing. If at all there is a syntactical error, uh, we'll see. Uh, currently, do I see any syntactical mistake over here? Mm, I don't see it. Sorry, this should be from this folder. Import this particular class. Okay, for from this location import this particular class. Fine. Now it should work. Let me go ahead and let me run the code. And uh, let's see if access was granted. Currently I see no error. That's an indication that access has been granted. Still, I just want to print a message uh, to the user that access to vision resource has been granted. Has been granted. Fine. All right. Let's go ahead and let's see. And you can observe where your access to resource has been granted. If I change my key slightly, authentication won't happen. I and I won't gain access to my resource. You can see one second. I saved it. In fact, let me just change this over here. Okay, save. And access to resource should not be granted. Uh, or maybe if it does not give me an error at front. When I will try to uh, see this resource, it, it, it won't be usable. Um, definitely this resource won't be usable if I put different credentials altogether. Okay, so if I put something like this, let's say definitely this should not be usable. Fine, currently it does not give me error in seeing this class, but this resource will not be usable. We'll try to see it, okay? So don't worry, you might see, see that, okay, over here this class did not give an error, fine. Um, what we'll see is, 
fine it did not give an error but this resource won't be usable why because you don't have the correct authorization to use it fine anyways uh, we'll also prove it so don't worry okay anyways for now let me give a good username and password correct username and password and move ahead we'll also see that if you put incorrect sorry not username and password you correct key and endpoint and move ahead if i put incorrect you will see this resource won't be usable over here fine uh, it Ideally, this uh, class should have given me error, but fine. It seems that this class does not have this capability. OK, not to worry. We'll go ahead and we'll still do our task. So what I want to do is after I've properly gained access to my resource, I want to go ahead and analyze images. Which images I want to analyze? Let's see. So whatever image I want to analyze, I will give it to my resource. But the data of that image should be in hexadecimal format. The data of that image should be in hexadecimal format. So what I will do is first I will make sure that the image data is being read in hexadecimal format. So which image data we want to read? Let me go ahead and let me mention the file path of it. So I will say that I want to read this particular image, which is in images folder, and the name of the image is treat.jpg. This is the image that I want to read. So let me go ahead and let me read it in such a way that it's converted to hexadecimal format. So in order to read the file, I will have to open it. And uh, here I will have to mention how I want to open. So I'll put a code of RB. RB stands for read binary. OK, so here I'm perform, uh, communicating my action that after opening, what do I want to do? Do I want to perform the write operation in the file? Do I want to perform read operation in the file and so on? Here RB means read binary. And it will read it in such a way that the data inside of it is converted to hexadecimal format. Let's read the data inside of the file and it will be read in such a way that it's converted to hexadecimal format. Once you have obtained the image data in hexadecimal format, okay, we'll try to pass this image data to my resource so that it can perform analysis. Okay, let's see. Uh, currently, let me print the image data to you so that you can see that it's in hexadecimal format. Let's check whether it is an hexadecimal format or no, and yes, exactly as expected, we have obtained image data in hexadecimal format. As per the documentation of this vision resource, if at all you wanted to do any analysis, it expects data to be in hexadecimal format only. Okay. Uh, this makes the uh, reading uh, data of it much faster. So if the data is converted to hexadecimal format, it can be read by the computer in a much faster way. That's why the resource is expecting an hexadecimal format. Okay, now we'll tell the resource that we have, you have gained, uh, we will, you have, we have gained access to you. So please go ahead and please analyze the image. Which image we want to analyze? We have, we will pass the data of the image in hexadecimal format. So we'll say analyze on this particular data of the image. And uh, what do you want to analyze? So we'll have to mention the features that we want to analyze. So let me go ahead. And let me mention those visual features that we would want to analyze. In order to do it now, there are different different AI models for uh, de detecting objects. There are different uh, AI models for detecting people. There are different AI models and so on. OK, so let me go ahead and let me get those models first. So I will say from Azure folder, there is another subfolder called vision. OK. Now, similarly, I'll write the full path and I'll just perform my import from azure.ai.vision.imageanalysis.models. Import visual features. Okay, fine. So through here, I will try to communicate that which visual features do I want to analyze. So let me go ahead and let me communicate that to my resource that which visual features do we want to analyze. So let's say the first visual feature is to generate caption. So for example, if anybody sees this particular image, it should say that a person is walking a dog. That is the caption that it should generate. Okay, so first I want to generate caption for the image. The next thing that I want to do is uh, I want to detect tags that was generated for everything in the image. So for example, uh, one thing that it sees in the image is a dog. So a tag will be generated called dog. Another thing that it sees, sees in this image is a car. So a tag will be uh, given called car and so on. So like that, all the tags that could be assigned to the image, it will try to show that to us. 
then what do i want to do is i want to go ahead and uh, perform analysis on the different objects that were detected okay by objects it will detect living as well as non living objects so it will detect a car as well as a person if you just want to detect a person then you should just use this visual feature called people visual feature and with that it will just detect that particular person it will not detect any other object like a car or a building okay fine uh, it will do the analysis after doing the analysis it will go ahead and give us the results let us store the results in a variable and let me go ahead and let me print the raw results for you obviously if, uh, from those raw results we'll have to uh, search for the particular result of our choice but let me show you that raw result over here let me go ahead let me show you that particular raw result i'll run my coding file let's have a look at the raw analysis result okay currently says access denied key is wrong is the key wrong let me check access denied ha ah, okay i'll just copy my key ha ah, okay the key was wrong i had uh, by mistake truncated my key okay fine so as expected you can see as i mentioned you won't be able to access the resource if any of the credentials are wrong now hopefully it should work let's check ha ah, currently it says caption is not supported in this region okay so i chose south central region so their caption is not supported not a worry uh, i should have chosen a different region there so let me choose a different region uh, i chose south central us because there is a uh, less traffic related issues but i will do one thing i will uh, try to deploy this in a different region all together so i'll do one thing i'll create another vision resource let me choose east us region now okay let me choose east us region i'll give it a name saying webinar vision new choose the pricing tier and i will proceed ahead to create this resource but first of all it is asking me to agree to terms and conditions i'll do that and after that i will ask azure to create this resource this time i have chosen east us remember different different servers have different uh, capabilities as well okay fine in east us all the capabilities are there east us is one where all the capabilities are there that's why people try to use east us a lot and that's why there there's a lot of traffic issues okay fine let's see in east us all the capabilities are there so we are we'll just wait for the resource to get created once it's created we'll see what to do okay it has been created now let me get the key for this particular uh resource let me get the key for it as well as the endpoint these are the two things that are needed to gain authentication to the resource we'll go ahead and get it so let me get the key and i'll paste the key over here and after that let me mention the endpoint as well okay perfect now let's go ahead and let's run this in east us uh, all the capabilities are there but there's a disadvantage there could be traffic related issues so maybe um, it might give us error while trying to access the service for a few minutes after a few minutes it gets solved but how currently there's a lot of issues in east us so i try to usually avoid it but fine all the capabilities are there in that resource let's see ah uh, and you can see over here i get a error so uh, i mean this is not even related to wrong authentication as i mentioned what happens is due to traffic related issues if at all it is not able to access a resource of east us region it just gives a error saying cannot access and it's not like i entered a incorrect key or something i entered the correct key i'll just call, show it to you this is the correct key copy and paste over here but as expected east us has that uh, uh traffic related issues availability issues that's why i always try to avoid this but fine instead of waiting for a few more minutes and trying to see uh, whether this east us thing gets solved or not we'll do one thing we'll go back to our previous resource that was deployed on south central us yes less capabilities are there but fine uh we'll try to work with those less capabilities that's okay okay after a few minutes i'll show you that east us uh, traffic issue will also be solved and uh, i'll show to you how to work with it it's just that you will have to change change the key and endpoint of that particular resource 
which is deployed in a different region. Okay, let's run our code. Here there is no traffic related issues, ah, but it says this caption generation is not supported. Okay, let's talk about tags and uh, objects and people, whether that is supported or not. Ah, okay, that was supported and I got my raw result over here. Now what I want to do is uh, from my raw result, I want to go ahead and uh, show you the particular result that I am interested in. So I was interested in the result for tags. Okay. And you would observe that it would print out, it would uh, give you multiple tags in the form of a list. So let me first print out the multiple tags in the form of a list over here. And it will assign multiple tags to this particular image. So for example, it has assigned a tag called outdoor because in this image it sees a outdoor nature. Then it has assigned a tag called land vehicle. Why? Because it sees a land vehicle in this image. Then it has assigned a tag called vehicle because it might have seen some vehicle. So just like that, see if you're uh, putting a post, Instagram post, don't you assign tags to that Instagram post? Like that it has assigned tags over here to this image. Automatically it has assigned. Okay, so if you want to do, let's say you're uploading an Instagram post, you want it to automatically assign tags. You can go ahead and uh, see what would be what would be the appropriate tags for this part, particular image. Okay, what I will do is I'll just print the tags one by one. So I will just say for each tag, for each tag in this tag list, I just want to print each tag information one by one. Let me do that. So instead of printing the full tag list, let me print each tag result one by one. Okay, and line by line, it will print information about each tag. There's the information of first tag. Next, we have information about second tag and so on. Okay, uh, and fine, we have got information about the tag tags. So we have got the tag name, then the confidence we uh, that the AI model has in that tag. So convert if you convert in percentage terms, it says it has 99% confidence. Confidence will always be between zero to one. Okay, in order to convert it to percentage, you have to multiply it by 100. So for example, for this tag called wheel, it is 95% confident that, okay, this tag is appropriate for this image and so on. So tag generation was one. Next, object detection. Okay, this is the important part, object detection. Fine, so let's have a look uh, what result it gives me. So here, I'll first show you the raw result for object detection. So I'll say from my result, give me a list of all the objects that are detected. So it will give me a list of all the objects that were detected. So apart from printing tag related information, you can see below it also gives you information about the different objects that were detected. Let me print it in a new line. So that tag related results and object related results are separated by a new line. And you can see, okay, in fact, it should be backward slash and a syntax mistake on my side, I have corrected it. And now the tag related result and object related result you can see is separated by a new line in the middle. Okay, fine. Now there's the raw result for objects. What I want to do is you can see uh, the coordinates of that object are given. Apart from that, the name of that object is given that what is that object and what percentage of confidence it has in that object. So it says that it has 72% confidence in that object. Okay, like that for different, different objects, different information is given. What I want to do is, luckily we have information about coordinates of that particular object. So using those coordinates, I want to put a box over that object. So let's say we have an image. Here there is a person. Here there is a car, let's say. Here there is a car. So I want to draw a box over that car using the coordinate values that are given. Okay, I want to draw this, draw this box. That okay, um, here you have an object, then here you have an object, and so on. I want to draw those boxes. How to do it? Let's go ahead and let's see. So, what I would want to do is first, uh, I will have to draw a box on the image itself. So, first, I will have to open the image in which I want to draw, do this drawing. So, I'll say, please open the image in which you want to do the drawing. So, on the same image that we want to do analysis, I would want to do the drawing. Okay, fine. So it will open up the image to do the drawing. After that, uh, what I'm thinking is, um, in order to draw, this Python would need a canvas. 
so let me go ahead and let me create a blank uh, let me go ahead and let me create a canvas of that particular size so i will say please draw a canvas of size okay i will mention the size over here i will say depending on your image whatever width and height uh, the image has create a canvas of the same size okay so i will say depending on your image whatever width and height the image has create a, ca a canvas of the same size so here, let me print the width and height first so here i'll just go ahead print the width similarly we'll go ahead print the height as well of the image and let's see what we get first we'll see what we obtain let's go ahead and let's check the same let's observe currently there's a syntax related issue huh? we'll try to solve it and first i just wanted to view the width and height of the image let's check so the width Okay. By the way, I got an error in this particular line. It says I cannot open the image. In order to open the image, we have to use this image class, and for that, I will have to import that class. So from PIL library, I have a class called image, which is what I will import. After importing, we can go ahead and call it. Okay. Let's see. So I've opened the image. I have checked the width and height of the image. The width is 800 pixels. Height is 533 pixels. Okay, 800 pixels in width, 500 pixels in 533 pixels in height. Okay, so I want to create a canvas with, I want to create a canvas over here with the same uh, width and height as the original image. So let's do that. So over here, uh, what is PLT? In fact, let me import that as well. So from matplotlib library, there is a file called pyplot and I'm just referring that file as plt. Now inside this file, I have a function called figure that will help us to create that canvas. So let me go ahead and let me create that particular canvas. And I will say create a canvas having the same width and height as the original image. Create a canvas having the same width and height as the original image. Okay. Fine. So we'll create that canvas. After creating canvas, what we are doing, what we'll do is for each object in this object list, I want to draw a rectangle. So how to do it? Let's go ahead and let's see. So I will just say for each object in this object list that we have obtained, let's go ahead and let's draw a rectangle. Okay. We'll proceed and we'll draw a rectangle. So in order to get that information about rectangle, uh, we'll need to focus on coordinates that can be obtained uh, from this field called bounding box. Okay, so I will just go ahead and just mention it over here that from that bounding box field, I will open information, I will get information about the coordinates. From that bounding box field, I will get information about the coordinates. Okay, so once I obtain the coordinates using it, I will try to draw a rectangle. So once I obtain the coordinates, using it, I'll try to draw a rectangle over that object. In order to draw a rectangle, let's see what we'll need. So over here, what I'm thinking is, I'll just show you how the coordinates look like for each object. Let me print it out for you. I'll run the code. So for each object, I'm printing out the obtained coordinates. Okay, for the first object, these are the coordinates. For the second, this is the coordinate for the third. And then for the fourth also. Fine, I've obtained my coordinates. Now what I need is uh, in order to draw a rectangle, I need the starting point of the rectangle and I need the ending point of the rectangle. So the starting point will be x comma y. The ending point will be x plus width of the image. Right, x plus width of the image. And the uh, y axis point of this ending point will be y plus height of the image. Okay, so we know the width of the image. We know the height of the image. So the ending point coordinate will be x plus width, comma y plus height. Okay, fine. So let's go ahead and let's mention those coordinates over here. See, we don't have the ending point coordinate directly. We have information about x and y. We have information about this, and we have information about width and height. So using this, we want to get coordinate of my ending point. So I'll do x plus width comma y plus height. That's what I'll do. Fine, let's go ahead and let's mention the same over here. 
So I will say the rectangle that I will draw will have these coordinates. First, I'll mention my ending point coordinates and then my sorry, starting point coordinates and then ending point coordinates. In order to obtain starting point coordinates, I'll just mention X comma Y. OK, for my ending point coordinates, I'll mention X plus width. X plus width. Comma Y plus height. Comma Y plus height. We'll go ahead and we'll mention the same thing with this. For the rectangle, I will obtain my coordinates. Now, once I've obtained these coordinates, what I would want to do is I want to draw a rectangle. OK, so let me go ahead and let me draw a rectangle. So we'll just say that please draw a rectangle uh, on the canvas that I've created over the image. Please draw a rectangle and I will just say please draw a rectangle over here. Let me write the full code. We'll say draw a rectangle using the rectangle function. And in order to draw it first, I will just pass the coordinates for it. So these are the rectangle coordinates. We'll just go ahead and we'll pass the rectangle coordinates over here so that it can draw a rectangle. Uh, that rectangle that we'll draw will be of certain color, like for example, currently this is of red color. So that outline of the rectangle, you want it of which color? We'll just go ahead and mention that. You can mention blue, any color. We'll mention cyan color, which is which is similar to blue. Then uh, that width of the rectangle, the outline in the rectangle, it will be of certain width. Okay. For example, if you want the outline to be very fat, then the width should be width of this outline should be more. If you want it thin, then the width should be less and so on. So you just mention that the outline width will be fat or thin. Okay, so I will have to mention it using pixel value. So I'll say it should be three pixel wide. Okay, if you want that uh, outline to be more fatter, increase the width and so on. It's completely up to you. Whatever value you can give, you can give it. It will be in the form of pixels. Okay, fine. So it will draw a rectangle on the canvas. Okay, so first we had a image. On that image, we drew a canvas. On that canvas, we have drawn a rectangle. On that canvas, we have drawn a rectangle. Fine. And after drawing a rectangle, uh, let me go ahead and let me just show that image to you. In fact, instead of just showing it, why don't I do one thing? Why don't I output it to a different file location altogether? So I will say whatever result we are uh, result we are operating uh, obtaining, put it in a different file called objects.jpg. And I will say that save my results that I have made on my canvas. Okay, save the results in a different file altogether. I'll say save the results in a different file altogether. Okay, I'll say save it and save it in this particular output file. Okay, up till now I'm not done the full work. Full work is yet to be done. Let's run the code and let's see if this uh, intermediate work has been done by, done by us or not. If the code is working. At the end, I will say that results are saved in a different file called objects.jpg. Okay, let's see if this is working or not. I'll just go ahead and try to run. Currently, I have an error. It seems there's a syntax issue. Instead of dot, I should have a comma in between because we're mentioning different different settings. Each setting should be separated by a comma. Let's see. Okay. Currently, there is an issue while calling this uh, rectangle. Uh, okay. What I have to do is I will have to mention this code over here that on the image that I have opened, I want to draw something. So let me declare that. And if I want to declare it, what I will have to do is I'll have to import a class. So let me import that class saying that I want to draw something over the image. I've opened the image. Now I will declare that I want to draw something on that particular image. Then it will understand that, okay, on which image I want to draw on that image, then it will draw can have a canvas and everything. Fine. So let me do this one thing. Let me do this one thing over here. Okay, fine. Let's move forward. We'll move forward now. And I'll show you what to do next. 
I'll do a small change in my code and then we'll proceed forward. All right, after declaring that I'm going to uh, draw it in this particular image, now it should work. Okay, so first I open the image, then I declare that on this image that I've opened, I want to do the drawing. In order to do it, do it drawing, we'll need a canvas. So we created a canvas and then we try to perform that rectangle drawing. Okay, let's see whether it works now. If it doesn't, we'll try to find out the solution for the same. So currently I have a, a issue, okay, which is that image data of D type object cannot be converted to float. Let's see where is it, uh, in which particular line I'm obtaining the issue. Um, I will just say show the image that I've opened because at the end on that particular image, the entire work is done. So I'll show the original image that I opened. On that image, I did the drawing and everything. Now this should work. Let's see. So I did those variable changes in between because of that this issue occurred. Oh, let's move forward. Huh. And currently I have an issue. Let's try to understand the solution of that issue. See, it says while saving the figure, it is treating the width as 8000 and height as 53,300. Whereas if you remember the original width of the image, it was 800. From 800, how did it convert it to 80,000? Similarly, the original height was 533. From 533, it multiplied by 100 and converted it to 553,300. Uh, so it is multiplying it by 100 in between. Okay. So while saving, what it did was it is multiplying it uh, by 100. So what I am doing is fine. Uh, in order to convert it back to the same um, coordinates at, as what it was earlier, currently it is multiplying by 100. Let's do one thing. Um, let's divide it by 100 over here. So it goes back to the original shape. In between it is multiplying by 100, not a worry. We'll say divide by 100. So it backs, it goes back to the original with and home. Now it should work. Fine. It says results are saved in this file called objects.jpg. Let me open it up over here and have a look. I wanted to draw a rectangle over the objects and those rectangles have been drawn. But currently, I also want to see that which particular object is treated as which, I mean, uh, with what tags has been given to the object? Is this a person or is this a car? Is this a dog? What What is this object? Okay, so if you remember in our results, we got information about those tags as well. So what we'll be doing is we'll be using information about those tags and we'll be writing those tags on the image itself. So on that will say that, okay, this particular object has this tag, another object has another tag and so on. Okay, let's see what to do. And by the way, uh, let me just print the results of the object detection. So apart from the coordinates, what else did it do? Apart from the coordinates, what else did it find? So it says that apart from coordinates, it has found the name of the object. Okay, this is the one that we want. And the same thing we want to write over the object. We can say that, okay, this is a car, this is a dog, and so on. I want to write those tags. In order to write it, what I will do is, um, we'll just have to do this one change. And I'm just thinking, uh, let me use the annotate function, annotate function for the same, which is used to write something. So I will say, what do I want to write? So from the objects that are detected inside here, you have tag related information. So I will go inside over here to get the tag related information. Currently in tag related information, I see a list. And currently inside that list, I have one element, which is this dictionary element. In order to obtain the first element of a list, I have to use index zero. So let me go ahead and let me mention over here that use index zero. With this, I will gain access to the first element inside of this list. Inside this, I have two key value pairs. First key value pair is called name and car. Second key value pair is called confidence and 0 0.7. I am interested in this first key value pair and particularly the value of this first key value pair. This is the value and this is the key of that value. Okay, so I'm interested in this particular value. In order to obtain it, I will just write it over here. But in that key value pair, give me the value which has a key called name. Okay, so for example, this key called name has a value called car, so it will give me that particular value, and that is the one that I will try to annotate. 
where I will annotate, I will annotate over the uh, object itself. Okay, so we'll annotate it over the object itself. So let me put the coordinates. So that X, Y coordinate that we had, the starting point of the object, this is where I will start writing my tag. Okay, so for example, my rectangle is starting at this position. So from here itself, I will start writing that this is a person. So my starting point of my text, of my annotation, will be this X comma Y. So I've mentioned it. Let's see uh, whether it works or not. And by the way, that text that, that I will write, um, the background of that text will be what? So I will say my background color will be cyan. Background color will be cyan. Let's go ahead, let's run the code. Let's see whether it works or not. And hopefully now our tag should be shown over the detected objects. And now you can see I have uh, assigned those tags as well that this is a person, there's a dog, there's a taxi, there's a car and so on. So this is the coding based approach. I usually like the coding based approach because there are a lot of customizations that you can do. Whereas if you, if you have used that non coding based approach, wherein you can just click on some buttons here and there, these customizations you won't be able to do. Like for example, I want to, to draw these boxes over the image. I wanted to write tags over those boxes and so on. That customization cannot be done with the without coding based approach. Without coding based approach will just give you the analysis results. That's it. Apart from that, these customizations that you want to do won't happen. That's why I like coding based approach a lot. And with it, I can do a lot of customizations, okay, in order to properly understand the results. That's why in this lecture, I'm only showing you the coding based approach. Yes, to understand the coding based approach, currently I'm writing code in Python programming language. So you will need knowledge of that. Unless and until you know Python programming language, the syntaxes won't make sense. But I hope the reason behind writing each line of code makes sense. Okay, the syntaxes, of course, won't make sense unless and until you're proficient in this programming language. So for any resource, guys, for any AI resource, Azure offers two ways. One is the without coding based approach. Another is with coding based approach. With without coding based approach, you can just see the result. But on those using those results, if you want to do any customization, that is not possible. Whereas with coding based approach, you can do all of these customizations over here. Okay. Fine. So remember with objects, it detects living as well as non-living object. With this people visual feature, it will only detect people. It will not detect things like dog, car, and so on. Okay, it will not detect those. And you can see one another limitation of this vision resource, which is that it only analyzes predefined entities. So it, for example, uh, did, did it analyze this traffic sign? No. So whatever it feels that, okay, it has a list of predefined entities and it only analyzes those. What if we want to analyze images, but on custom entities? I had told you that for that we have a service called search service. It also analyzes these images. Apart from anal analyzing images, it also analyzes text as well. But you might say that, okay, this, this service analyzes these images. Even the vision service does the same. What is the difference? With vision service, it only analyzes predefined entities. Whereas with search service, you can analyze custom entities as well. That's the major difference. Anyways, so just to ask a question over here, let me ask that question. And before that, let me open the chat. I guess uh, some doubts would be there. Let me answer those over here. Subham says, can you tell how these help a data scientist? See, Shubham, it completely depends on your use case. So, for example, what I would want to do is let's say um, I uh, let's say I have a I have received a project from the uh, traffic department of Maharashtra. Okay, let's say I live in Maharashtra and I have received a project from them. What they want to do is they want to monitor all the CCTVs and uh, from there they want to uh, analyze the different different objects through it and so on. You might be seeing it right in some serials. What they do is in some computer. Uh, they try to uh, see the video CCTV footage and there uh, some boxes are drawn over it. What happens? Behind the scenes, those videos are converted into images. A video is nothing but a series of images. So that video is converted into images. Okay, a series of images. On each image, you do this analyze, uh, analysis. 
that okay where do you have these objects and so on okay you can do customization also obviously with this vision resource you can't but with the search resource you can that okay this particular person is shubham this particular person is smit and so on so this could especially be helpful in that uh, for traffic department okay this is one use case there are a lot of other use cases okay you might be seeing in serials they show you that that there is a video running in a computer on that they try to show those uh, boxes over the objects and in, uh, uh, above those boxes some tag is written that what is that object and so on okay with vision service yes you can do analysis but uh, only on predefined entities with search service you can do analysis on custom entities as well pradeep says can i zoom ha that to anyways you can do without ai models that anyways you can do with any programming language particularly with python programming language you have libraries to do that but that anyways you are able to do without ai models no need of ai models for that project zooming and everything you can do okay pradeep says how canvas and image on canvas are there so pradeep what i mentioned was first i open the image then i declared that on this image i am doing going to do the drawing then in order to do the drawing i needed to have a canvas okay so i drew the uh, i i made sure that i have my uh, canvas ready and that canvas will be drawn on that particular image because in the image i want to draw it drawing so that canvas will be overlapped onto that image and once the canvas is overlapped onto that image then the drawing can happen on it okay shubham says so i cannot do this thing you can do it absolutely buddy jupyter notebook is what it is another tool right to write write, write your code visual studio is also a tool just to prove it to you just to prove it to you here for example uh, let me open jupyter notebook you can absolutely do it with jupyter notebook however i feel visual studio is lot better okay it uh, i i like that comparatively you can do it in jupyter notebook also not a big deal take any code for example any code that we wrote for example the code for doing that speech translation i am running it in jupyter notebook okay it is asking me first to enter a target language let's enter then it will ask it to do some speech translation hello i am in a lecture currently hello main vartman mein ek vyakhyan mein hu okay and you can see it as done that i hope you are able to hear that voice back as well i was able to hear it i hope my system's audio was audible to you okay so it's not i mean it's just a tool jupyter notebook is just a tool where you can run code I, however it's i feel that visual studio code is much better for me but a tool can be anything at the end of the day you have to write a code whether it's in jupyter notebook tool or visual studio tool tool does not matter code matters ah uh, shubham says it was audible okay perfect so guys do fill in the feedback uh, and uh, the link of which arshi has given in the chat till then what we'll do is we'll move to our last resource of today okay that is document intelligence resource so what we'll do is i will have a invoice document with me and uh, instead of me getting the information from a document manually i will let uh, the ai model itself give me the information so if i ask my ai model to give me information about the address mentioned in the invoice it will give me it will search for that address and give me the address and so on okay so i want to extract information from a document but not manually i want automatically i want it to be automatically done by the uh, ai model itself okay let's see in order to uh, use document intelligence service i will have to create a resource of that service so let me go ahead and let me create a resource over here okay document intelligence i'll create a resource of document intelligence service i'll click on the create button to do that when i do that i'm redirected to a form that i have to fill so let me fill in the details of the form first field in the form is asking me to select the subscription remember in your um, azure account you can have more than one subscriptions in it each having different permissions assigned to it and each having different amount of money credited into it so you can choose the subscription of your choice then next it is asking me to select the resource group so either you can create a new resource group or select a existing one let me select a existing one after that it is asking me to select the region in which the resource lies so let me select that 
I will choose a region called Australia East. Let me choose East US, although there's a lot of avail availability issues. And I guess Central India should be fine. Okay, but fine. Uh, usually what happens is East US has a lot of capabilities. Other re regions have less number of capabilities. For example, we saw it in our last demo itself. We chose a different region. It didn't have this uh, caption generation capability. East US had as every capability that you can think of. That's why people try to use that particular location. And there's a lot of traffic on the servers of that location because of which you get availability issues. Okay, but fine. Anyways, let me move forward. Now the next field in the form is asking me to assign a name to the document intelligence resource. Let me give it a name saying webinar. DI resource webinar document intelligence resource. Then it is asking me to choose the pricing tier. So let me choose the pricing tier of my choice free or standard with free. No cost will be deducted, but it has a lot of limitations. Standard tier has less uh, has comparatively less limitations, but yes, cost will be directed with standard tier. Let me choose standard tier for now. I'll go ahead and ask Azure to validate and check it if it can give me the things that I'm asking for. If the validation is successful, then the create button should be enabled. And now you can see it has been enabled. Let me click on it. And with this, a resource of document intelligence service will be created. Now, just like with any other resource that we have seen, there are two ways to access this. One is uh, with code and without code. So guys, can you tell me the benefit of using the with code option? What is the benefit? Why am I showing you this? Without code option will be which will, would be would have been much simpler for you. But why am I showing you this with code approach? What is the benefit of with code? It's not simple to implement. I get it. Without code will be simpler for you. With code is not simpler. So what, what is the benefit of with code then? Uh, Shubham says that we can customize, correct, customization. And when I say whether the customization involves any integration or anything like that, we can go ahead and do it. Absolutely. So that's the benefit. And that's why I always prefer the with code option. I mean, rarely I use the without code for none of my client related work. I use without code option. I use with code option only. Is that in my batches? If student is asking, then I show them without code option, but that's not the one that I recommend. Yes, it will be easy for you, but you won't be able to do a lot of customizations with the results then. Okay, anyways, let me go to the document intelligence resource. Again, two ways. First is you can do it without code by exploring the studio. On the other hand, you can use the with code option as well. Let me use the with code option. So here I'll create a folder called document intelligence. And uh, let me have one invoice document on which I'll try to perform analysis. Let me have one such document so i will have one such document and show how that document looks like on that document we'll try to do some analysis let's see okay so this is the document in pdf format you can see this is the invoice over here it has a lot of information like invoice date invoice id then the vendor address okay vendor address you have a lot of other things you have the compensation mentioned and all of that. What I want to do is instead of me going through the details, I want to have the AI model scan the details and I'll just ask my AI model that, okay, give me the invoice ID. It should tell me invoice ID is so and so. I will ask it, give me the invoice date. It should tell me invoice date in so and so and so on. Fine. Let's go ahead and let's see how to do this. So what I will do is I'll create a coding file over here. Let me create a coding file. And I don't want to create that coding file within. Okay. This folder, I want to create it outside of this. Huh? I have done it. So I don't want to create it inside this sample invoice folder. I wanted to create it outside. Let me call it analyze.py. Okay, let's move forward. Now, guys, as you know, in order to access the resource, we'll need to gain authentication from it. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's gain authentication. 
So in order to do that, I'll need two things. First is the key of my resource and second is the endpoint of my resource. So let's get these two things. So one is the key. Two keys are shown to you. You can use any one. So let me mention the key of my resource. And second is the endpoint. That means the link of my resource. So let me copy that and paste it in my coding file. OK, now let's go ahead and let's gain access. In order to do that, I'll need help of a class which I will import. So I will say from Azure folder, there is a subfolder called AI. Inside that, we have a file called form recognizer. From that file, I will try to import this particular class called document analysis client. Document analysis client. This is the class that will do that authentication. So let me go ahead and let me call it. I'll pass two things. First is the endpoint of my resource. And uh, second is the key of my resource, but I can't pass the key directly. I will have to pass it with help of a function which I will import. So just like I did earlier, if you remember, I had imported a func I had imported a function through this function. I had passed my key right through this function. I had passed my resource key. If you remember. Same thing I will do in this coding file as well. So let's do it. So from Azure folder, there is a subfolder called core. Inside that subfolder, I have a file called credentials. And inside that file, I have a function called Azure key credential. And let me go ahead and through the help of this uh, function, we'll pass information about our key. Okay, so let me pass my resource key now inside this function. Okay, so we have passed two main things. First is the endpoint of my resource. Second is the key of the resource. Using these two things, I'll gain access to the resource. Now, in the next line, I'll just print that access to resource has been granted. Access to resource has been granted. Let me go ahead and let me print that. OK, once access has been granted, I'll show you what analysis we can do. So first of all, I will have to mention that which particular AI model I want to use in order to do analysis. Now in this document intelligence category, there are many AI models for dealing with invoices. There are different AI models for dealing with uh, uh, things like, uh, for example, in US, I guess there's a social security card, right? So for that, for social security card, for reading that, there's a different AI model and so on. However, currently I have an invoice document. This is the invoice document. In order to analyze that, we have an AI model. Let me mention it, which AI model I'm going to use. So its name is pre-built invoice. That's the name of it. I'm going to use this particular model. Now, uh, in this, fine, it will go ahead and scan the document. That file, that document will, will be written in which language? So I will say it, that the particular document will be written in English language. Then let me go ahead and let me mention the URL of the document. It's not necessary to mention it. However, there are many ways you can analyze the document by passing the entire document itself or by passing the URL of the document. What I will do is I'll pass the URL of it. So guys, this document, the one that I was trying to show you was obtained from this GitHub link, GitHub URL. Here it is. I'll just copy it and paste it over here. Okay. But uh, even if you don't have the URL, if you just have the document itself, then also you can go ahead and perform analysis. Does not matter. I will do it with help of URL just to show you that um, it will directly go to that URL, take the document and do analysis. So it's not necessary that the document that you want to analyze should be there in your local laptop. So even if the document is not there in your local laptop, and still it's fine. Currently, I had it in my local laptop, so I can show it to you how it looks like. Okay. But what I want to do is I don't want to. Uh, I don't want my AI model to take the document from my local laptop. I want to take it from this URL only. Fine. OK, let me go ahead and let me ask my resource that. OK, now you have gained access. Uh, I have gained access to the resource. So please begin the analysis. And begin the analysis of the document. From the URL. OK, begin the analysis of the document from the URL. So I'll pa first pass the name of my model that will do that analysis. Second, I will pass the URL. 
on which document I want to do the analysis. And third, I will say that in that document, the language is written in which, I mean, what is the language written? So I will say that it was in English language. Okay, I'll just mention that particular information. With this, it will do the analysis and I will get my analysis. Uh, with this, what it will do is it will do the analysis basically. Now, in order to get the analysis result, what I will have to do is I will have to write another code. I will say, give me my analysis result. So it will give me my analysis result. I will save my result in this variable. Let me save it over here in this variable. Okay, fine. And then uh, what next it will do is uh, I want to go ahead and first show you what all entities uh, it has identified. OK, so it will only identify information about pre uh, pre predefined entities or predefined fields. So first, let me go ahead and let me show it to you how this law, raw result looks like. It, that raw result won't make sense, but I just want to show it to you. Let me open the terminal in this particular folder. And in my terminal, I will say, please run this Python file called analyze.py. OK, it says OK, there's a spelling mistake over here. I'll just correct it. Credentials spelling was wrong. Let's run the code. Access has been granted. Let's see the raw result. It won't make sense to you at first. We'll see what to do. Ah, this is the raw result. And as I said, for uh, at the beginning, this raw result won't make sense to you. What I want is I want, I want to understand. OK, it, it might have found the values for each of the fields. OK, what I want to know is I want to understand for which uh, what are the different fields for which it has found the value. So in order to do that, what I will say is. Um, let me con OK, let me see. That there should be a field called documents. Let's see over here in this key called documents. What all values we have? Let's see as far as document analysis is concerned, what it has done. Let's check. OK, it has given me this uh, raw output over here. What I want to do is this output. I want to convert it into a dictionary. So let me go ahead and let me convert it into a dictionary. So I will use the enumerate function to convert it into a dictionary. And when I do that, I will get key and value pair. OK, I'll get key and value pair. So let me go ahead and let me mention the same. So I'll say for ID. Of that value and let me mention the value itself. OK, so I'm converting it to uh, this result that you got. I'm converting into dictionary. That means key value pair key will be called ID value will be referred by received field. OK, let me go ahead and let me show you what this looks like. So what are all the what are all the receipt fields that were detected? So it should say that okay, well, I've detected information for address. I have in, uh, detected information for vendor name and so on. Let's see. Currently over here, I will have to still uh, complete my code. This code won't be enough just to print out the receipt fields. And you'll soon observe it's not enough. Okay, what we'll do over here is currently I am interested in. Uh, the names of the fields. I'm not interested in the values. I can see some values as well. I'm only interested in the names of the fields. OK, that means fine. You have detected the full address, right? So address is a field. We have detected information about uh, invoice ID. So invoice ID is a field and so on. Let me go ahead and do that. And you will observe that now we should obtain names of those fields. Uh, so it says that I have obtained information about amount due, invoice date, invoice ID, and so on. So now if we want to get value of this particular field, we can go ahead and get it. So let's go ahead and let's get it. So for example, I want to get information about, uh, let's say, vendor name. So I will just say, I will just mention over here that from these different fields for which you have obtained information, get me the value for a field called vendor name for a field called vendor name. Please go ahead and please give me the value. OK, so we know vendor name in our receipt uh, in our invoice. 
was Quantoso limited. So it should say Quantoso limited. And at the end, after printing out the fields information, it will print that okay, name of this vendor name is Quantoso limited. Let me print it out in a more better manner. So I'll say vendor name. Is so and so and I'll print this in a new line. Okay, let's run this. So my vendor name was Contoso Limited. Similarly, I want uh, to check my invoice ID. Now I don't want to manually go into my document and check my invoice ID. I will just say that my invoice ID I want to get. So please print it. In order to get invoice ID, I will have to use this particular field called invoice ID field. I'll just mention it in my code. And now apart from vendor name, it will also print invoice ID. Let's run our code. Let's see what happens. So apart from vendor name, now it also should print invoice ID. Let's check. Invoice ID that is mentioned is INV100, and you can see same was mentioned in the document. Invoice ID is INV100. So I don't have, I have to go into the uh, document one by one and see the value of the field. Like this, guys, let's say if you're working on thousands of documents, will you go inside those thousands of documents manually and see the fields? It will be very tedious for you guys. Instead, you can just use the AI model and just apply this AI model on those thousand documents with code and easily you will be able to do it. Currently, I apply it on one document. Like this with code, you apply it on thousand. Okay. It makes your work a lot easier. Okay, like that you can go ahead and check the value of each field one by one over here. All right, so guys, uh, this was the usage of our third service called Document Intelligence Service. So guys, the first demo that we saw was that of Speech Service. Second demo that we saw was that of Vision Service. And third demo that we saw was that of Document Intelligence Service. Okay, so I hope uh, it made sense. I agree. We use the coding based approach. There is another approach also available non coding based approach, but we use the coding based approach. I get it that if you are not familiar with these with uh, the programming language concepts, this coding based approach uh, would have been a little difficult for you. But I hope the reason behind writing each lines of code makes sense, made sense. If the syntax made sense, did not make sense, that's fine. I hope the reason made sense. Okay, fine. So uh, that's it for today then guys. One second, I have, have some doubts. Let me check it. Once a student says, Shubham says, if the same actions I can perform in Jupyter Notebook, why would I use Azure? Shubham, um, without Azure, will you be able to create these resources? See, these ready-made AI models are there on Azure, na? What I did was, they were, they were scattered around different Azure services. So these ready-made, for example, for vision uh, uh, service, there are uh, AI models related to that. Okay, and so on. So there are ready-made AI models on Azure. You don't have to create those AI models. In our lecture today, did we create our own AI models? Though? No, we did not. All we did was we just used the ready-made AI model for analysis. Where did we create our own AI model? We didn't. See, what is an AI model? Statistical representation of a real-world process. That means you apply some statistics or mathematics to simulate what would happen in the real world. Did you apply any mathematical formulas of our own? No. We didn't create our own model. AI model was already there on Azure. All we did was use it. What I'm saying is for using, you can use any tool, Jupyter Notebook tool, Visual Studio tool. But the main AI model is on Azure, na? So you will need Azure. Jupyter Notebook is a tool to write code. Just like that, there are other tools to write code, but whatever tool you use at the end of the day, these ready-made AI models are on Azure. Okay. So you will need Azure regardless of the coding tool that you use because your models, ready-made models are on Azure. Without that, how will you use these ready-made AI models? Harsha says, Okay, and then uh, Shubham says, what is the money factor? What? What is the money factor? Is this for AI models? Jupyter Notebook is a tool, guys. There, it is a coding file. It's not only for running code for your AI field. It's for running code for any field. It's just a tool to run your code. 
okay and it's a free tool jupyter hornbook is a free tool just like visual studio code is a free tool jupyter hornbook is a free tool there you can write your code for free not just for ai field for any field okay harsha says if the resource is created what the end point is would it still incur costs what if the resource is acha ha ha so yes for resource ha huh, you are saying if you are not using the resource then still uh, will some cost will be deducted so see there is some minor cost that you have to pay for the resource creation okay there is some minor cost that you will have to pay because we, because your resource will be deployed on some server of azure so for uh, you will be deploying it on some server so since you are using some server of azure so some minor cost will be deducted but it's a one time free but depending on how much you use you will have to pay that much cost so let's say if you use it one time you will have to pay for one time if you use it 10 times you will have to pay for 10 times for each usage maybe you have done more work in one usage so according to the work that you do you will have to be paid so it will be two things first you will have to pay upfront cost for the resource that you created but it's a one time fee then depending on how many times you are calling the resource that many times you will have to pay okay vijay says can it works on ha ah, absolutely vinay absolutely it can do that rajiv says can you also share the python coding file yes i'll do that so in fact let me just remove my keys uh, and after removing the keys i'll send you my coding files okay and let me upload those coding files over here can i upload it let me check plus okay is there a way to upload i guess i don't see a way but fine i'll make sure that you get it over email or something like that i don't see a way is there a way files okay i don't see that way but fine i'll make sure that it's sent to you over email or something harsha says suppose i did not use it for one month ha ah, yeah, yes you don't have to pay the usage cost then but that one time fee uh, you will have to pay for resource creation but ha uh, if you pay that one time let's say it will cut a cost for, for that one time fee after that if you don't use it for one uh, or uh, for one year no issues but okay let's understand this there is a minor cost that you have to pay for the um, resource that you are creating okay so it's not like uh, say uh, if i keep my resource live for one day or if i keep my resource live for one year on azure server do i have to pay the same fee no if i keep my resource live on azure for two days i will have to pay some fee if i keep my resource live for two weeks i will have to pay more fee okay so there is one cost that is just that you just have to pay for just keeping your resource on the azure server that is one cost that you have to pay for keeping the resource on the azure server second cost that you have to pay is for the usage okay so yes if you keep it for one month if you keep your resource live for one month you don't have to pay that usage cost but for one month your resource was uploaded on some server of azure right so you'll have to pay that minor cost but that is very very minor okay that is very very minor it won't be that um, it it won't be big for you okay maybe in uh, one rupee just for keeping it uh, for a full month okay i'm not talking about usage just for keeping the resource live uh, maybe for one month somewhere around one or two rupees okay so yeah it will charge that so there are two type of payments first is it will charge you for the uh, uh, time duration uh, for which your resource is live on the azure server second is the usage cost okay so achi has submitted the feedback link please fill in the feedback achutya says is there any session for python uh, so what synergetics our company does is on every week we have a, a webinar some of the webinars will be conducted by me because depending on my availability some will be conducted by other trainers okay so you can contact archi she will mention all the uh topics uh, that are going to be covered in the upcoming webinar so if at all there is a python programming webinar then you can attend it on that particular date you can get that information from archi okay 
LinkedIn, yes, I'll share my LinkedIn. So let me share my LinkedIn. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Also, you can connect with the Synergetics team at, uh, themselves. If you have any doubts over webinars or anything, what topics will be covered in the upcoming weeks? Okay. What is the agenda for those topics and all of that? You can ask the team. Okay. You can contact uh, the Synergetics team. The social media links Archie will share shortly. So I've done sh with Shubham. I've shared my LinkedIn link. Harsha says if I deploy a VM. Ha ha. Yes, yes. Correct. You have to pay some cost now because uh, for the number of or uh, for the duration that you keep it live. Correct. Absolutely. So same concept. Correct. Clear now. Ocha. Rajiv says, can we do more session? Yes, Rajiv. In fact, um, uh, in a month, we do have at least uh, two sessions, two webinars on Jenny. Eh? At least, if not more. So you can contact with Achi uh, exactly on which day a JNEI lecture is going to be conducted. Uh, Shunil says for high volume scanning, should we use any document databases? No, no, no. Azure handles it. Azure handles it. Okay. Azure handles this. Uh, no need to use any other tool for high volume document. Azure and will handle it on its own. Okay. Uh, Sunil says performance won't be impacted. No, at the end, okay. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you are saying, will this uh, document intelligence resource handle doc document of big sizes? Are you saying that? Is that your question? That will this document intelligence resource handle document of big sizes? Yes, it can handle. And obviously, uh, and, uh, uh, you are correct in saying that if at all the document is a little big, then uh, you know, applying your AI model to get analysis will take slightly more time. So time will be a factor, but apart from that, no other issues. So time will be a factor that if the document is big, then uh, you know, to go through a document, obtain information from it, it will slightly take more time. So yes, depending on the document size, the time factor varies, but apart from that, no other performance issues. Time factor will be more if the document is big. Okay, but apart from that, no other tool you can use to minimize that time. Okay, there is no way to do that. If the document is big, that AI model will need more time to analyze it. No other tool you can use to minimize. Okay, fine. And that's why, guys, see, uh, up till now, you have only seen the benefits of uh, these uh, ready made AI models, but they have disadvantages also. For example, all the things I mentioned them is fixed. They are working is fixed. If you want to tweak, it's working just so that you have higher, higher uh, perform. If you want more performance, you cannot tweak it. For example, let's say uh, Sunil wants to make sure that the time taken is um, less. Well, the there's a ready made AI model. It will take the time that it will take. We cannot change it. That's why there is still importance for people who can create their own AI models. With this, you can tweak the working of the AI models according to your need. Okay, so it's not that people who know how to create AI models from scratch, they don't have any demand. There's still demand for people like that. These uh, ready-made AI models still have certain disadvantages. Not a lot of tasks they can do. Yes, um, it will be helpful for these minor, minor tasks, but still, there's still demand for people who can create their own custom AI models and not use these ready-made AI models. Fine, anyways, that's the point that, that I wanted to make. So, all right. So thanks for attending guys. That was it. That was it for today. I hope you learned something.